Good morning. My name is Zoe Mayer, and for my capstone project, I decided to look at the psychology of marketing. So my research question was how do marketers use psychology to successfully market their products? And I wanted to do this because I've always been really fascinated with psychology. I just think it's really cool to study how the brain works. And I also work in retail and spend time on social media. So advertisements are everywhere. And I knew there was a correlation because there's already people studying it. But I wanted to do some research on it myself. So for my internship, I interned at the Idea Center in Richmond. I did this last fall around September to October for a couple weeks. And I also did it with Maria Peterson. And that's a picture of the team right there. And as you can see, it's a really small team, which is really nice because we got to work with all of them individually and see kind of all sides of how a marketing firm like that operates. My mentors were Barry Martin, who is the president. He founded the Idea Center back in 1995. And we had a conversation about why he did it. And I thought it was really cool. He started it because he could really think that marketing could make a difference. And it was really nice to hear a perspective like that because they take up a lot of medical clients like you'll see on the next slide. And he, the re, he said they do that because then they can reach more patients who can get access to the healthcare they need. They'll have an easier time finding it. And you don't hear that a lot in such like a corporate field. So that was a really cool perspective. I also worked with Mitch Bonadies, who is the graphic designer and web developer. We did most of our hands-on work with him like this. This is a marketing plan for the Dermatology Associates of Virginia. So we basically looked at their website and pointed out things that they could improve on, things that they could make better. And one of the main things we found was that their photos were kind of outdated and they also showed mostly old people, not old people, but older people. And we wanted to help. One of our recommendations was to include people of all ages in their pictures because people of all ages go to the dermatologist. And I know if I wanted to go to a dermatologist and I saw pictures of people who weren't my age or anything, I'd be kind of intimidated. So we thought that would help them bring in more clients. Um, this is some other pictures of what we did with them. On the left, we were learning about their client center, which is how they track analytics. Maria explained this a little bit yesterday. It's how they analyze the performance of their websites, their advertisements, things like that. And on the right, we also got to see the creative side of it. That's Will, the videographer. We got to hear how he creates the videos, how he films them, edits them. We also got to fly the drone. That's what he's holding. That was really cool. But it was really nice to see both sides of the marketing field and kind of speak with all of them and get a really all around understanding of it. For my community service, I'm working with the Richmond SPCA to help them plan their 22nd annual dog jog, which is a big fundraiser they have every year. It's actually happening this Saturday, so in two days. And I worked mostly with Lori Mavica, who is the manager of events. I've also worked with kind of other people on the development team, which is what she's on. And I'll explain kind of more of what that is. So this is a lot of what I've done. On the left is an email I wrote. So since I'm like a high school student working with them, they wanted my help to get more youth involved, more high school students, more clubs. So that's an example of an email I wrote to the Richmond Youth Kickers Club, which is like a youth soccer club. And I wrote that to a bunch of different clubs. It basically just says what the dog jog is, how it helps them, and like what it is, and how they can sign up, and giving them a promo code to get them interested. And I sent that to other clubs like schools in Richmond, 4-H clubs, running clubs, anything with people that might be interested. And I also, like I said, worked with a lot of the development team. So that's people involved in fundraising, finance, donations, graphic design, social media. And it was really cool to learn a lot from all of them. Because I thought, I thought, you know, if I'm working, if I'm doing my project on marketing, I'm really only going to be working with like the social media director. But I got to work with all of them and see how much work they all put into it and see that marketing isn't just promoting it. It's asking people who have donated for donations. It's offering promo codes. It was, they really taught me a lot and it was a great experience. And I really liked this, this part of my project because I got to work with animals like this. This is a dog named Mildred. She is really sweet. And the dog jog really helps the SPCA because they are a nonprofit. They get almost all of their money from fundraisers. And this is a huge fundraiser for them. About 4,000 people attend. So far, they've raised over $170,000 from it. And they usually get, and that all that money goes towards animals. They take in about 4,400 animals a year. So it was really nice to kind of see, like, yes, I'm helping the development team. I'm helping them plan it. But it was also really nice to see the animals that I'm helping too.
Now, in my research, that picture is really weird, but I'll, it, it makes sense. For my research, some of the most important things I found that are involved in marketing that also tie back to psychology are emotional appeal and branding. So emotional appeal is a big thing in marketing. It's what makes an advertisement stick in a consumer's mind more if it elicits an emotion in their head. And I actually spoke with the head of marketing at Virginia Tech. His name, his name is Dr. Rajesh Bagchi. And, he, and I asked him if he thinks that advertisements with an emotional appeal that work better than any other advertisement. And I asked him maybe for some examples. And one that he provided that I never thought about was Allstate. So a lot of people think that, you know, I won't get in, I won't have an emergency today. I won't have a car accident on my way to work. Nothing will happen to my house today. But Allstate, if you've ever seen one of their ads, their whole driving point is that can happen to you, that will happen to you to kind of stress you into getting insurance. And it works. And the other thing I found that's really helpful is branding. This is really important to a company because it's how consumers see them. And if consumers see them in a negative light, they're not going to want to go purchase anything or like contact them. So this ties back into that picture on the left, which is ties into a topic called phonetic symbolism, which is how our brain, if our brain hears a word and we think of the sound and like the way it looks, and we associate that with like an emotion. And that ties back into that study called the Buba Kiki effect which was a study where participants were shown those two shapes and given those two words, and they were asked to assign one of the words to one of the shapes, and 95% of them associated it with the round shape being booba and the sharp shape being kiki, showing that we really do process words in a way that we associate them with colors, emotions, shapes, things like that. And a real life example in the business world is there was this company called Tribune Publishing, and they wanted to change their name because they wanted to be like a futuristic online publisher. That's how they wanted to convey themselves. So they thought of a new name. They thought of Tribune Online Content, but then they shortened it to Tronk, which really doesn't convey what they wanted to convey. That's not what you think when you think of an online publishing company. It didn't really work for them. The study I looked at or the article I looked at that mentioned that was a few years old, but as of the time of that article, they were in the process of getting bought out and the deal fell through. So that, that whole rebrand didn't really work for them. So during this project, I definitely learned that people want to help you. I was really scared to reach out to big companies or marketing firms because it's just such an intimidating thing to imagine doing. But I learned that if you don't reach out, then nothing good will happen. Because we reached out to about 10 marketing firms and heard back from maybe four, and three of those were no's. We only got one yes. And so I really learned that there's no harm in reaching out. Ms. Reard actually taught me that a lot. Every time I was like, should I email them? She said, reach out, like it can't hurt. And so that definitely ties into my advice for future Blue Ridge students. Don't be afraid to send a quick email. The worst they can say is no. It's just so easy to type up a quick email. And then they want to help you. I was really scared going into a marketing firm. I was like, oh my gosh, they're not going to want to help me. But they do. They want to teach you everything. And for future plans, I'm not sure where I'm going to college yet. I'm definitely hoping to go in Virginia, and I want to study marketing or history. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I've definitely found it helping out like more than just this project. When I was doing, well, this is the project, but when I was doing my interview, I was really scared to reach out to Virginia Tech professors or like, because I found a few that studied a lot to do with marketing and psychology. And I was so scared. I was like, they have too much to do. They're never going to want to talk to me, but they did. And so I'll definitely take that into like college if I need help with something or like reaching out to jobs or like an internship or something. It was definitely a good lesson I learned. Yeah, definitely. Like once I send the email, I'm like, okay, it's out of my hands. It feels much better. So you talked about how great it was the idea thing was the two sets of creative and the community. Mm -hmm. Are you attracted to one side more than the other? I definitely, I thought they were both really interesting. I really liked learning about them both. I definitely like more of the creative side of it more. We spoke with um, Adam, who I didn't mention on here, but he, 
because he was out most of the time we were there, but he did stuff with advertisement. And they were advertising for, I think it was like the Richmond Tattoo Convention or something. And he showed us how they do it on like TikTok and Instagram. And I thought that was really interesting. I like that part of it. Yeah, so they mostly use the client center that I mentioned, which is how they track analytics and data from their websites. And we actually, one day we were there, they gave us their login and we went, they gave us a few websites and they said, okay, go in and find these websites in there and look at the different analytics for them and see what they could work on. So we got to like work on it by ourselves and like mess around with it. And that's mostly what we worked with. We also watched um, Will use one of the editing softwares he used, I think it was maybe like Final Cut Pro or something, but hands-on, we definitely use the client center the most. <laughs> I mean, I definitely, I might keep up volunteering there because everyone's really nice and it's just like a really great facility and they definitely do a lot of good. And I'm volunteering at the dog jog on Saturday. I go back tomorrow and Saturday to help out, like set up. So I'll be there from nine to two if anyone goes. I know, I think it's supposed to rain. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. Okay. I'm gonna meet you over there in one second. Please. Right? That's right. I can't see your name, so I think you should claim that it has your name on it. I would hope so. <laughs> right. We're trying to. You to sometimes you just gotta pray the technology actually works. <laughs> I always pray. <laughs> All right. So, however close or far away, if you, you decide right. like how loud you want it to be, um, the clicker. Let me just put this one up. You look very nice. Don't be fooled. This is a show choir fashion. Oh, I love it. That's great. Um, okay, so down. When you're editing your slideshow, down and the next slide is yeah. always down. So down is next. Okay. You need to go back, go back. If you push the wrong one, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? Just push the other direction. Oh, no. This um, is the pointer, laser pointer. But it only really works if you're directly on the TV. It yeah. Otherwise, right. it won't yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and then we would like you to kind of stand in between the two lines. Okay. And, and that's just to help you face the audience mm -hmm. because if you turn around, you're not. But they want to see your face, right? Yeah. And then just remember to breathe. Are you proud of what you've done? And share that. Yeah. Tell us about it, right? We, have good stuff. we don't know what you are doing, mm -hmm. so there's no like, right or wrong. Yeah, like, no. Improvise. But just keep it. Improv. improv. Yeah. I do a fair amount of that. That's right. I don't yeah, like improv. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Dick, and I decided to do my project on breaking the stigma or just mental health at home. So I wanted to choose a topic that, in particular, I was really passionate about. And at the time that I was sitting down and planning all of this, I was deciding between theater, meteorology, specifically like emergency response, and mental health. And Going into this year, I believed that my intended major in college was going to be psychology, so I decided to stick with mental health, and uh, that intended major is something that I've stuck with, and I'm really happy with this topic. So I started with my research, like I had my research question formed before I had anything else, and I wanted to see how we could break the stigma regarding mental health at home, specifically for men. And I did this by dividing the research into three parts. Uh, the first part was just data diving, looking at the prevalence of mental health in the United States, uh, how the pandemic affected mental health, and also the costs of mental health. Uh, then we looked at the stigma, sources of stigma, 
big ones were, <coughs> excuse me, uh, big ones were cost, um, and a big one was for men in particular was traditional like standards of masculinity, which, you know, and um, then we offered solutions. The tough part here is you don't want to offer like big solutions that are like really hard to implement. I wanted to start small. So one of the big ones that I found was that advertising should encourage getting help instead of promoting self-care. Self-care, excuse me. Um, I love self-care. Self-care is great for mental health, but it should not replace mental health care. An important thing to note, I did both my internship and my community service through the same organization, the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation, and my main point of contact was the Director of Mental Health Education, Mrs. Sarah Janes Gobble. So for my internship, um, everything about this project was mostly self-paced. For my internship, uh, the big thing I ended up doing was building a, there we go, building a resource library for the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation's website. And a lot of this was like mental health resources, education, where to go if you need help. But another big part of it that I went to was just stories. And when I first started my research, that's me at their office in October doing research. When I first started the research, the big thing I wanted to look at was TED Talks, because there are a lot of great TED Talks. This one in particular on the right is from Alex Smith. He is, was a professional quarterback for 15 years. And in 2018, a routine tackle snapped his leg in half. And the ensuing infection that he got nearly killed him. So he tells his story of his resilience, how his wife supported him, and how two years down the line, he got back on the field and led his team to the postseason. For my community service, I ended up evaluating the uh, the foundation's mental wellness toolkits. These are resources they have online that are mostly for education. And I evaluated them in order to ensure that the information that they had on those toolkits was up to date and still like relevant with a younger and ever changing generation. So in addition to me on my own evaluating all of the toolkits and providing feedback, uh, here at Guchen High School, I've been gathering some of my peers and we've been sitting down and evaluating just one toolkit, the Stress Awareness Toolkit together. And um, I have a group that's set to meet next week about that. And the group, the feedback we got from the first group was really great. So this project was almost entirely self-paced. And that taught me, number one, how I work and where I work because I struggle a bit with working for hours at a time, especially since my main workspace is my desk in my bedroom. So that can kind of, the psychology of that, I can kind of like get tired. Um, and another big regret, I, when I'm doing work, I like to sit down and do the work. So I ended up not taking a lot of pictures during this process. And that's just me trying to not get out of my workflow. But if I had to go back and do that again, I would be a lot more strict about the pictures. Uh, my biggest advice for seniors, if you're going to do a self-paced project, there's nothing wrong with doing a project that you're pacing yourself on. But be a lot stricter with yourself. And I would say I'm heavily involved with the theater program here and this year as well I've been involved in show choir so I've been very busy. Find your off months and try your hardest to get the project done during your off months. Because now March is coming around, spring rehearsals are in full swing, our show choir competitions are this month, I have my final one this Saturday. Just pace yourself, know when you're going to be busy and get it done. As for my future plans, I am still deciding between three schools. My top school right now is James Madison. However, I am still considering Mary Washington and uh, Longwood. And I will be majoring in psychology and hoping to go into the mental health care field. If that doesn't work out, I'm hoping to do nonprofit work. Thank you.
Yes. Okay. And is the, can you talk a little bit more about that community service and, and the benefit of the service? So um, the toolkits are, they help the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation with their education. They want to make sure that the information that they are portraying and the advice that they are giving is up to date. And a little piece that I forgot to mention, a little bit of brain fog. Um, is there the toolkits? There we go. The toolkits all feature uh, student testimonials. Like they'll ask the questions and then the students will record their answers. So, actually, for this project, they are updating their life transitions toolkit because a lot of the information there comes from the pandemic. And we are, at the very least, trying our best to move past the pandemic. Not quite pretend it didn't happen, but you know, not associate with it anymore. So um, I sat down about a month ago and recorded myself answering three questions that they had to refresh the toolkit, I guess, so to speak. So it is a lot of information if you're like not familiar with mental health really at all. I came in with a I came into this project with a fair amount of understanding about mental health and also for the focus group here I did not want to pick a toolkit that could be considered overwhelming. So I didn't want to pick one like directly about like mental illness. I wanted to pick something a little bit more relaxed that doesn't require like as much deeper talk. And I'm happy with the toolkit that I chose. I think the advice you gave was spot on and really useful. Um, is there anything, and so that kind of leads into question about like yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that advice you gave it because that's the thing you learned through the process <laughs> of picking it. I would say really how I respond to stress. Hey, stress awareness. So I tend to not respond to prolonged stress very well. So more recently on my days off of rehearsal, I will go home and I will actually get outside for about an hour. And that just, that time allows me to refresh and just clear my mind for a bit, because often when I get home, my brain's a little all over the place. That allows me to calm down, and then I can, when I'm ready, I can head inside, grab a snack, and just sit down and work. Did you have your hand up, Hannah? Or... Okay, <laughs> that's fine. There you go.
Krishna and Krishna. Does anyone want to just correct that on the uh, screen? It's, it's, it's shooting to that little computer over there. I wonder how they don't have it. Okay. Okay. The brain needs it to be right? Okay. Now look at that. That's good. Take a pause. Take a deep breath. Nobody will notice. And start over. Right? Or start again. And nobody knows what you're playing with. And there's no right or wrong, right? <laughs> and then, are you proud of what you've done? Yeah. Watch your story. I'm just asking you to stand in between the two lines. And we want you to face the audience because we want to see your face and not your back. So just kind of giving you a little bit of a angle there. Okay? Okay. Okay. We're ready. I don't know where this is. Oh, yeah. Do we need to wait for Miss Out? 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 Okay, okay. All right. Um, please help me welcome Jacob. Good morning. I'm Jacob Pudwell, and I did my project on the future of engineering. Um, I chose engineering as my topic because over the past two years, I've kind of realized that's something that I want to pursue in the future. Um, so to take advantage of the senior capstone project, I decided to do my internship with Mr. Paul McGuire. He's a product development engineer and consultant. He runs his own company by himself, Adapt um, Product Solutions. And what he does is he helps clients through the product development process um, and solving problems within the products, as well as um, linking them to manufacturers and suppliers. So he has over three decades of experience in the engineering field. Um, he started out as a plastics engineer right out of college, which is a pretty niche degree, engineering degree. Um, his work ended up leading him to the Stasher company. Stasher wanted to eliminate the use of plastic Ziploc bags. And so they worked with Paul to develop a silicon reusable Ziploc bag. Um, this bag ended up making it onto Shark Tank and its notoriety from the Shark Tank episode, which was season nine, episode 15, actually landed it on uh, Target shelves. So, um, one of the more recent products he's been working on uh, is this hearing aid battery dispenser. He was working on this in the fall with a client and it's the product that he initially wanted to show me during our, um, my internship, but unfortunately the client he was working with had personal issues and had to drop the work on that product for the time being. So in January and through February, um, Paul brought me in on this gel ice pack uh, he's working with two different companies um, to develop these. Uh, it's similar to normal gel ice packs, but they decided that they wanted to try a couple new things. Um, it uses a little bit softer material compared to other ice packs. It has a thicker gel with inside it. And the main difference is the textures. It is um, one side of the ice pack is smooth, the other side has these waves. And the idea behind that is that when you take it right out of the freezer, and you put that smooth side on your skin, you kind of get that really like shocking coldness. Um, but with the wavy side, it doesn't feel as comfortable um, when you put it on your skin right out of the freezer. So with that, um, I was able to meet with him and the companies that he was working on it with, as well as the manufacturing factories. And I also met with him and the patent agent that he was working on getting the technology patent for. So I was able to learn about a bit of the patent process. And then the main thing I did with him is he had me test the products. He wanted me to create um, a set of baseline data for the products so that when the factories were doing their test trials on the product, they could I'll try and line it up with the baseline data that I created. So I ran a experiment um, where I measured the temperature of the ice pack uh, over about an hour. And then I did four different trials with that, two uh, trials on each side of the ice pack. 
And then after that, um, Paul also asked me to do a little bit of research on phase change materials. Phase change materials are materials that have a unique property where um, their like melting temperature and their uh, freezing temperature are a little bit closer together than most materials, which means that they can stay um, in a smaller range of temperatures for a longer time. And he wanted to know if that would be viable to implement into the ice packs to keep them at like an ideal temperature for a longer period of time. So I um, went and looked into that and we kind of decided that it was probably gonna be a little too expensive for the companies and that it wasn't a good route to go down right now, but maybe as a future option. So after I met with him about the ice packs several times, he took me to Spark Product Development. They're a company in Richmond, one of the few companies around Richmond um, and outside of Richmond that do product development. And I met with him, Spark, and a client who was bringing to them an idea that he wanted to turn into a product. So the client was Walter Smith. He spent like 65 nights in a VCU hospital after um, having a bone marrow transplant. And so he was told that he should be walking as much as he can during that uh, process of being in the hospital. And he recorded that he walked around 650 miles over those 65 nights um, in the hospital. And what he noticed was the IV pole that he was hooked up to was really cumbersome. And um, that even for the nurses, it wasn't as optimized as he thought it should be. So he went to Spark and went to Paul to bring the idea he had to change the IV pole. Um, and he wanted to get it developed. And so in the meeting, uh, Spark and Paul, they're trying to gauge how far along he was in the process, how far he wanted to go, and really what his idea was. And then while I was at Spark, they gave me a tour of their facility. They're a team of about eight engineers, so it's a really small team, but they do a lot. They show me a couple of the projects they're working on, which I'm not allowed to talk about. But um, it was a really cool experience seeing that small team, uh, how much collaboration there is within that. So for my community service, I volunteered as a mentor for the Gusha Middle School Robotics team. This is Brian Tate. He's a STEM teacher in the middle school, and he's the FTC Robotics Team Instructor, instructor for them. So this is the Cool Ranch Doritos. They're the very first Gucci Middle School robotics team. Um, they started a little bit late in the season, around late October. So I volunteered with them from late October till now. Uh, part of robotics is they have to design a robot to compete. And the competitions have certain challenges that allow you to score. Um, points and they have to work with other teams as well to score those points. So as a team, they had to decide what the best way to score those points was going to be and design their robot around that. Um, they also had to assign roles to each other and figure out how to work as a team. And so what I did is I kind of guided them through all those processes. I helped them work as a team, helped them through that problem solving and the different aspects of the research. And I think what I spent most of my time at the meetings doing was guiding them through the build process. Most of them, the only thing they've ever really built with is Legos. Um, so I was able to teach them how to use different tools. Um, I helped them look at the different CAD models they had and the instructions and guide them through the build process. So this is them at their first competition. Um, they didn't score a lot of points, but it was a really valuable learning experience for them. They learned a lot about what the robot could do and couldn't do. And they also learned from the other teams there. Um, they looked at their robots and the experience allowed them to look back and reflect on what they could have done differently and how they should reiterate the robot for the future. And so based off of my experience with my community service um, and with hopefully all those young future engineers, 
I decided to base my research question on how the education system can influence a new wave of engineers. Engineering is really important in our society because the world is always changing. Um, this room looks completely different from what it did five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. A lot of the technology is very different and that wouldn't happen without the right minds behind all of the changes. So within schools, um, STEM is taught a lot. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, every student is taught science and mathematics. Those are some of the like really important core subjects. And recently, technology has been another subject that has uh, kind of popped up in schools a little bit more. Um, but what there isn't is engineering specific courses. That's kind of a lacking part of STEM. And there's a couple reasons for that. The main reason is there isn't a specific engineering curriculum that's really hard to decide what that would look like and how it would be implemented. Um, it takes a lot of people to design a curriculum and figure out what's the most important thing to teach and how to teach it. And there's also a lack of people that could teach it. So the overall lack of system behind that makes it difficult to have a whole engineering curriculum. So short term, um, schools should try to expose kids to engineering more, as well as provide more extracurricular classes and engineering specific electives that allow students to learn more about engineering, problem solving, um, collaboration, and have more hands-on experiences. And then long term, I think schools should begin to try and develop an engineering curriculum and decide what that would look like. Um, another issue within STEM, along with the lack of engineering, is the lack of women in STEM. Um, the engineering field is only about 16% women as of 2022. And I think that based on my research, just by exposing um, people of all ages and all genders, especially in uh, elementary and middle schools, to engineering, that could help encourage more people, both women and men, um, to become engineers in the future, or decide to continue within the STEM field. So through my community service, um, I was really excited to see that the middle school finally had a robotics team. Um, it was really cool to see the kids learn about robotics and problem solving. Um, it's something that I kind of wish I had in middle school. And I'm really glad that I was able to help kind of kickstart the first uh, season of robotics for the middle school. And uh, all the kids, they all want to keep doing it um, next year. And hopefully they'll, they've been inspired to maybe join the high school robotics team or become engineers in the future. Um, as for what I learned about myself, I learned a lot throughout each step of the process. One of the big takeaways I have is that no matter what environment you're in, you can, there's always something that you can bring to the table. Going into my community service, I hadn't done anything with robotics before, even though I've thought about doing it. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was really qualified to help the kids there but I realized there is a lot more that I could do besides having the technical experience from robotics. Um, as for advice that I would give future seniors, um, I would pursue something or base your topic around something that you plan on doing in the future. That's what I did. I wanted to do something with engineering and I ended up learning a lot about the engineering field um, and what goes into it. And I kind of affirm that that's something I want to do in the future. And so speaking of that, I plan on pursuing a mechanical engineering degree at either UVA or Virginia Tech.
some specific classes that you think would be good as a high school teacher to offer to students that you would give up in the Well, last year through Blue Ridge, I took the UVA Introduction to Engineering course, which is a college level course. And that kind of introduced me to the engineering design process and what the field looked like. Um, so I think if that was implemented in more high schools and not through colleges, that would be a really good starting point. Um, and really just anything to promote problem solving, um, some of the engineering habits of minds like communication, collaboration, creativity, um, and invention, innovation, um, anything like that would be beneficial. But it is that, that problem solving and that approach to problem solving. Uh, I am fascinated by the place you did your internship. <laughs> um, you talked about your your mentor there as being um, kind of a new having a new perspective. Did you see that as a positive or a negative as a professional? Um, I think it allowed him to be really valuable um, to certain to like all the jobs he worked in. Um, I think him as a person, he's a pretty niche person because he he started out working with a lot of bigger companies and he kind of figured out that he didn't like that. He didn't like the managing side of and the like corporate side of things. So when he started his Adept product solutions, it's literally just him working out of his home office and he doesn't even promote his company at all. It's kind of just by um, word of mouth that he gets into contact with clients and he's able to do what he wants. He's able to work with the people he wants to work with and who he believes will be successful. So that was something that he explained to me that was really important to him. That's cool. So when he has a client, his deliverables to the client, is it the product alone or is it a product plus a report? Because you were doing research into like different options that could be incorporated, right? I think it depends on who he's working with. Um, he does a lot of different things. He helps them with actually designing their product and coming up with solutions to their product. He helps with the patent process as well. Um, he has a couple of patents himself. And um, I think one of the main things he does with Adept is um, helping them get it into manufacturing. He works with uh, a factory in Hong Kong and he actually helps the factory kind of develop different ways to manufacture the products so um, if to make the product if they need to design like a different nozzle to um, manufacture it he helps them with figuring that out as well so he kind of does yeah So, yeah, the first time I met with him when he was talking with the companies and the manufacturers, they talked a little bit about um, the patent strategy. And then the second time I met with him, I attended a meeting with him with the patent agent. And they kind of talked about, like, what things they actually would be patentable um, and how to, like, try and there's, – there's a lot – I learned that there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of different strategies um, because you've got to, like, a lot of ideas kind of overlap and you got to try and cover as much of your ideas as possible. Um, so I learned that there's a lot of strategy that goes into it, which I didn't really realize before.
pushing it down. Okay. So I think it's better if it gets a little bit to go down. <laughs> On you. This is just for the recording. And um, this is just an in between the two tapes right here. And then that kind of gives you an angle so that you can kind of look at your head. Because we want to see you and not your back, right? And if you are breathing, breathing is most important, right? Your brain can't function. You won't be able to do it if you stop breathing. Okay? Yep. So if you get stuck, nobody notices. Take a and do a deep breath, right? And just change. It doesn't have to be perfect. There is no perfection. It's just who you are. And that's yep. all we want to know, okay? Share what you've done. Any questions? I don't think so. Are you ready? We can do this. <laughs> I guess so. Can you do something fun for a couple minutes? Probably, yeah. You can. It'll be fun. You're going to make it. It'll be fun. Yeah. Put it up higher. Sorry, I did this. Is that better? Great. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Please help welcome Sai. Hi, my name is Trey Paquette, and I'm going to be presenting on river safety. Before we get started, I am going to cover topics such as fatal river accidents. So if that makes you uncomfortable, feel free to leave the room. So to introduce my topic, I'm going to tell two stories, the first of which is going to be a little bit more lighthearted. The second one's going to be a little more somber, but we'll get to that one in a second. About three years ago, over the summer, I was working at a, an adventure camp. I was teaching kids to kayak, to, and we were swimming in the river, kayaking through the river. Little did I know that 300,000 gallons of sewage was being leaked into the river from Goochland County. <laughs> so yeah, even after work, we were still in the river. This is a shot of pipeline. It was a beautiful day. No, it did not smell like sewage, but it was there. And about an hour or two after we got off the river, the Virginia Department of Health advised people not to go on the river. <laughs> So my second story takes place at Hollywood. It is right next to Belle Isle, and the river was pretty high that day. Um, a, an experienced rafter named Leah Patterson, uh, her raft flipped, and she got stuck in a strainer. She did not survive this event, but her body was recovered afterwards. I love this thing. Which leads me to my research question. How does the community affect the safety of the river? And how, do, in return, does the river affect the safety of the community? Which is kind of boils down to two different topics. Personal river safety, which is about how you can protect yourself on the river, and environmental safety, which is how you can protect the river. So, I discovered that the, the James River is the longest river in the United States that is confined to one state. It is 348 miles long, and 40 of those miles run through Goochland County, Virginia. And you can access the river at a bunch of places, the closest being Tucker Park, which is right down the road from here. I worked with the James River Association and RVA Paddle Sports during my internship. And the first thing I did for this was I got on a Zoom call and I learned about a type of fish that used to be abundant in the James River called the American Shad. Unfortunately, their population is as close to zero as you can possibly get now. 
and that is due to pollution and other factors affecting different environment, in fact, affecting their environment in a negative way. I also watched, I also at my mentor's request came to a screening of a documentary um, that was about five kayakers kayaking from Richmond to the Chesapeake Bay. They went over a lot of topics in their film, but one of the things that interested me a lot was ecology. So I looked at a few different types of plants and animals on the James River. The first one I'm gonna discuss here is the bald eagle, which in the 1970s was at an all-time low on the James River. But after the passage of the Endangered Species Act, they have grown, the James River has grown to be one of the most densely populated areas for bald eagles in the United States. Another thing I looked into was oysters. Did you know one oyster can clean 50 gallons of water a day? They also, also 24% of the Virginia's oysters comes from the James River. I also looked at the a type of tree called the bald cypress. They can live to be hundreds of years old and they serve as great habitats for birds like blue heron and bald eagle. Unfortunately, things one of the biggest potential dangers to these beautiful creatures and plants is pollution. Something I discovered was uh, called the Keepone disaster. In Hopewell, about 50 years ago, there was a company that was dumping keepone waste into the river. It polluted the river, killed a bunch of fish, and they had to ban fishing for decades. Even after they lifted the ban, people were still hesitant to get their seafood from Virginia because of this event. So this is my mentor, Grace. She works at RVA Paddle Sports and has a Master's of Environmental Studies from VCU. She helped me plan a Paddle in Your Park day and Paddle in Your Park days are great days that people can come out to their local park, get in a boat, um, and just paddle around. It's a great way to get outside, and it's a great way to introduce people to safety measures and just being out on the water. I also wanted to discuss ways the river community affects personal safety because it's not exactly in my research question, but it's definitely a parallel question to that. Uh, and I found a lot of resources for river safety, one of which being the Friends of the James River website, and another from right here in Goochland County, Virginia, being the Goochland Fire Department puts out an information sheet every year at different areas on the James River. So for my community service, I worked in the James River Park system and I painted over graffiti and I picked up trash. Picking up trash is important because almost 3 million people get their water from the James River. This whole topic is pretty important because river accidents are not that uncommon and some of these accidents are fatal, which is obviously kind of a public health concern. Which brings me to recreation. If you can't have a clean river, you can't have recreation. And if you can't have a safe river, then people aren't going to do recreation on our river, especially since millions of people use this watershed every year to fish and kayak and raft and do all sorts of recreational activities. If I were to do this project again, I would figure out my research question earlier. It took me multiple marking periods to figure it out and it was a little bit annoying because I was trying to cover a lot but not too much. And my advice for future seniors is to practice this presentation over and over and over. That's going to be the best thing you can do and I thought it was unique because I don't think anybody else here has said that. Here we go. So to no one's surprise, my future plans also are on the river. I want to participate in the River Rock kayaking race and uh, go back to being a counselor this summer. 
Um, next school year, I want to be at George Mason University studying computer engineering. Thank you. Any questions? I think that could be interesting, yeah. Yeah, I know you um, have such a passion for congratulations for being a topic that you're so passionate about and knowledge about, knowledgeable about. Uh, were there ways that this project stretched you that you hadn't, like you had this passion even before this material? How did the, the project itself kind of stretch you? I didn't really like, I didn't really like presenting. This was a little bit of a stretch. I didn't like, like contacting people can be a little bit weird sometimes because like reaching out to different people and especially when they don't respond to emails and you're just sending multiple and it almost seems a little bit desperate sometimes. <laughs> I do not. That okay. is something I should research further. Okay. As you were doing your uh, the community service, right? That was the passion to do stuff. Yes. Do you want to sign the community service? Uh, <laughs> getting cold trash. <laughs> I did. I found like a soccer ball. I found just like a lot of plates. Like there was there was like this one area. It was like in the middle of like vines and spikes and i found like a whole meal there and i was like who who is eating here <laughs> and i really appreciate all of the i like ecology so much and the animals and all of that and so all of your efforts to learn more that bothers you. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this and the clicker, it just need to be intentional when you push it down, right? Right. Um, but down is next. So like when you're editing your slideshow, the next slide's always down. So right. just think about that going down. Um, we are aiming for that little on the cord, there's a little dongle thing on there. That's okay. that's where it's communicating. So that's yeah. why people are pointing it that way and trying to make it better. Um, if you need to go back, go the other direction. Okay. If you press the wrong thing, but don't okay. press the other direction. It doesn't matter, right? Um, and this is the, the pointer. It doesn't work unless you're directly on the screen. Okay. So I'm not, probably, is it okay if I just point with my hand if I need to? I think that's better. Um, and then you're asking me to kind of stand in between the two tapes right here. Right. And then stay through the... I want to have one more thing. Oh, I sorry. Want you, I want you to breathe. This is the most important part, okay? Okay. Because your brain can't function without oxygen. Right. Right. So if you get stuck, 
Just breathe and think. See, I just took a deep breath and you didn't even notice, right? Oh, right. Just take a deep breath. Just pause and take a deep breath. Yeah. And then start. And honestly, we don't know what you're supposed to say. So there's yeah. no right or wrong. Right? There's a lot of pictures to help me. Yeah. I have a lot of pictures. Just share your story. Are you proud of what you've done? Then yes. share it. Like, tell us about that journey. Okay. okay. So, all right. Do you have any questions? Or no. No. I just don't. make sure you try to face the audience. Okay. And just share your story. Okay. All right. Thank all right. you. Will you help me welcome Hi, my name is Maggie Goodman, and I chose to do my senior capstone project on interior design and mental health. Take a look at this room for me. How does it make you feel? Could you learn here? The colors contrast one another. Cords scatter the walls and floors. There's hardly any natural light and no greenery or plants. This room in particular has some really harsh memories attached to it for me. And if you listen, I'd love to tell you more about it later in my presentation. So based off of that, my research question is, how does the way a room is designed impact a person mentally? I've always been really interested in the layout of a room and how that influences a person's mood, whether that be by incorporating natural light, nature, um, the way colors influence mood, patterns, designs, textures, um, and more. So for my internship, I interned with professional interior designer and home stager, Jill Johns. This is actually a picture of me and the team on the last day of my internship, which lasted for a total of four days. And I chose to do this back in October during our fall break. <clears throat> and this is my mentor. As I said before, she is a professional home stager and interior designer. She um, brought her company up from the ground, Transformations by Jill. When she was staging homes in the beginning, she was actually using her own kitchen table and couch to do so because that's all she had. But over time, she was able to build up so much things. And she just recently purchased a warehouse to store them all, which holds everything you could possibly need to decorate a home. Um, yeah, so these are some pictures of the warehouse, which was really, really beautiful. She gave me a long tour of it because it was just so ginormous. So on the first day of my internship, I attended a design and staging consult with Mrs. Johns. Right here you can see um, I was at a staging consult. This woman up here in the top left was trying to sell her home. And so she hired Jill Johns just to um, <clears throat> stage it for her. As you can see though, her home was very, very beautiful. So there wasn't much we needed to add, but we did just take a look around. We walked around our house for about 30 to 45 minutes, just discussing what we could add or take away to make our home more appealing to buyers. Right after that, um, I attended a design consult with Mrs. Johns. And this one was a lot longer, actually two to three hours of walking around this couple's home. Uh, there's the wife. I unfortunately don't have a picture of her husband, but this was really, really fun for me. They actually had lived in this house for over a year and had never actually gotten the chance to decorate their home. The house they had lived in prior to this one, they had lived in for over 10 years. And again, they had never decorated it because they could just not agree. So that's why they hired an interior designer. It was really beneficial to me just to listen to Mrs. Johns try to communicate with them and try to find ways where they could compromise because really the wife just wanted pink everywhere and her husband just had very specific ideas of what he wanted for every room. So just listening to her talk in a really professional way kind of influenced him too and they found ways that they could compromise and so on the second day of my internship, I was actually on the way to a home staging with Mrs. Johns and the team when on the way we got a phone call from a woman who was not satisfied, satisfied with the way her home was staged. So immediately we rushed back to the warehouse to pack up some things to make some final touches and just critique her home. 
she said things like the wall, the rug was too small, um, there was no stools for the countertop. So this is just a picture of Mrs. John's packaging, some things from the warehouse to fix the kitchen. This is a picture of me making the final touches on her design, which is right here. And this is just some pictures of me packaging up some other things to critique her bathroom. Um, before I move on, I just wanted to point out that the car rides to these design consults and stagings with Mrs. Johns were almost just as exciting as actually getting to decorate them. The phone calls that she was getting in the car that I got to listen into were crazy. I mean, for example, sorry, for example, there was one time where she got a call from the husband of a really concerned woman. They were getting their house staged and she had such a strong emotional connection to the way her home was decorated previously. Um, it was very traditional and in order to get it sold, they really needed to add more modern pieces in that, um, especially for newlyweds or younger couples who are looking for a place to stay. So, she actually had to be removed from the site eventually because she was just breaking down and crying and the team couldn't do their job, which just really ties right back to my research question, how does the way a room is designed impact a person mentally? Um, <laughs> just walking into a room, a potential buyer could walk into a room and the way they feel just from that one experience could determine whether they buy the home or not, which was crazy to me. And this, back to my internship, this is the design after we made the finishing touches. I was really pleased with it, but we actually did end up changing this setup right here because um, the homeowner was not too fond of the bowl. But Oh, and this is just some more pictures of me carrying in some bins from the truck. And this is the stools that we added in the kitchen to make it more homey. So on the third day of my internship, I actually attended a home staging with Mrs. Johns and the team. This was um, a really fun day for me because while we were in the warehouse, Mrs. Johns was asking for my opinion for what I thought would look best in the home. So I really tried to envision myself as a potential buyer and tried to figure out how would I feel, which colors would um, <clears throat> provoke good emotions in me, which ones would make me want to buy this home. So that was really special for me. I felt like I was part of the team. I was, you know, really working for her. Um, I got to pick a lamp for the kids' bedroom along with some bedding. So that was really fun. <clears throat> also, this project was completely, completely different from the others because the house was bare to start. It didn't have things in it already. So we needed to pack a lot to come and stage this house. I actually carried in this rug and this coffee table, which are kind of heavy. So this is just some pictures of me unloading the truck. I think I'm just carrying some outdoor pillows in this picture. Um, and here you see how empty the truck was after we unloaded it. It was so full that when we opened it from the start, things were just like falling out. So it was a lot. And this is just some more pictures of the house. On the fourth day of my internship, I attended a midterm rental with Mrs. Johnson's team, which is pretty much when a person is going to be living in that house for six months or more. So this, again, was completely different from any of the other ones we had done because we weren't just staging the home. We were staging the home for them to live in. So we need to stage every part of the house, not just the primary bedroom, the bathroom, and the kitchen, as we were doing in the previous houses. We staged every single room. And as you can see, this house is not just a one-story little tiny house. No, this is a three-story house. So carrying a couch of all those stairwells with the team was a lot. But getting to struggle with them was actually part of the fun, because I felt like I was an interior designer, too. So it was really cool. Oh, and yes, this is when I got to build a twin bed all by myself, which I've never done before. 
um, I made really close friends with a girl on the team. Her name was Natalie, and we actually raced to see who could build the twin bed, bed the fastest. Right across from me, she was building it. I won. But <laughs> this is just um, a picture of me building the bed um, with a screwdriver and directions. So for my community service, I decided to redecorate and paint Mr. Hover's classroom with Anastami. For our fundraising, we advertised our senior project during lunch over the course of two days, and we did this during A and B lunch. So it wasn't too long, but it was just, amount, just the right amount of time to raise about $80 to $100, which was really, really good. We actually, um, after talking with the principal, Mr. Steely agreed to cover the, re the remaining $80 that we needed to um, cover the cost of the paint, which was a five gallon bucket of aviary blue paint. And then later on, we plan to hold an open gym just to um, raise the remaining amount of funds we need if necessary. And this is just a picture of Anastamy and I at lunch. I actually made this poster on paper and then Anastamy made that flyer on Canva. And here are some photos of us painting. We chose um, blue because it is known to be a soothing color, not like the bright orange. Actually, it has the opposite effects of the bright orange that we were painting over. <clears throat> and here's just some more pictures from us painting. I actually did not know that you were supposed to open up a door or a window or something when you paint, so the fumes really got to me that day. <laughs> but in the end, we did get about a wall and a half done. And this happened a couple weeks ago. We painted for about two to three hours. So we were really happy about that. So lastly, I just wanted to talk about the hold on May 11th. So on May 11th, Goochland High School had an eight-hour hold for really unknown reasons. I wasn't really sure. but. I did not have my phone that day, so I had no way of contacting anybody in my family or anybody that I did know. I actually sat up against this wall right here for about four to five hours with people I was unfamiliar with, and I was terrified. There were people around me having panic attacks and others who had to use the restroom in buckets full of cat litter. Um, getting the opportunity to paint over these walls and the harsh memories that come with them is really incredible to me. And I know it's going to be incredible to everyone else who had to experience that hold in that dirty classroom. So for my research, again, my research question is, how does the way a room is designed impact a person mentally? Um, I really <clears throat> was trying to figure out the way colors, patterns, and textures influence mood, along with natural light, as you can see with the Children's Hospital article, um, and plants and other nature. That is why I plan to um, take off Hover's curtains, change them with prettier ones or none at all, just to bring in all the natural light we can, along with painting it a more soothing color, adding speaker lights around the room with plants in all the windowsills, and So in the end, this project taught me that there are so many different career paths and job opportunities for me than what I thought was even possible. When I was younger, I really thought, oh, I'll grow up and be a doctor, or I'll be a teacher, or go into the military. And I never really thought about how many other job opportunities there are that I can use my um, abilities for. So I really hope that in my future, I can become an interior designer just like Mrs. Johns, but that may change. Oh, and some advice for future <laughs> Blue Ridge students. I would say choose something that you love and something that you're passionate about. Don't just choose something that you feel obligated to do in your future or that you feel like, oh, I'll make a lot of money. No, choose something that you love so you can use it as a stepping stool to reach those opportunities 
that will be available for you in the future. So, <laughs> so um, after high school, I plan I planned to attend one of these two universities, but after much thought and consideration, I've decided to attend JMU, <laughs> which is really exciting because I haven't told anyone yet, so I thought, why not just add it into my presentation? Um, thank you so much. Any questions? <laughs> So he likes it so far, but he's really wants to know when we're going to finish that. <laughs> he's a little worried that we're never going to finish it, but we are committed. We're going to get it done. Um, Anna just had her wisdom teeth out, so we had to plan around that. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> yes? I'm fascinated when you started at Uh, a person's mental health, their their the way they react and their, their emotions and so forth. But then, as you got into your internship, it was really kind of the reverse of like how people become attached to their surroundings, not not how the surroundings influence them, like the surroundings, the decorations coming first and that influencing the person, but rather like they just get so attached to it. Right. So this leads to my question. That's what you said. Um, what do you see as the most important skill an in interior designer needs? That's a good question. Um, I would really say reading the person that you're decorating the home for because it really depends on the person. I mean, some people are really into that traditional way of decorating and they get attached to it, like I said, like the woman um, on the phone call. And others are really into that modern look. And it's just like, it all depends on the person. Being able to read them in that short period of time that you have the consult with them, which I wasn't even sure you needed to have a consult until this internship. But being able to read the person in that short period of time is really, really important because it could it could determine if you even if they even call back and want you to design their home after all. So the psychology before you know how right. to Um, that's a good question. I've actually, I'm really interested in both the staging and the design part. Um, at first, I didn't even know she was a home stager. I was like, oh, she's an interior designer. That's perfect. That's what I want to be. But now that I got to experience all these home stagings, it's, it's really impacted me, and I feel really drawn to that, too. So I think I might want to do what she's doing and just kind of do a little bit of both. Yes? <laughs> I'm really glad. We're going to wait for about 15 minutes. 45, guys, we'll, we'll come back.
Good morning, my name is Cole Bradley and I'm doing my senior project on redesigning affordable housing. So why am I interested? Well, I've been interested in architecture for a long time, so I knew I wanted to do something with architecture. So when, when I was young, I participated in choir at River Road Baptist Church. And even though I was interested in choir, I was more focused on the architecture of in studying the architecture of the building itself. As for the redesigning affordable housing part, the affordable housing part, I was uh, sort of motivated by the community around me. I found out that a lot of people in Goochland, especially the teachers here, can't even afford housing within Goochland, and that really sparked my interest in finding ways to make housing more affordable. So this is my internship mentor, Robert Riggs. Um, of, he currently works at Van Meter Homes and has a master's in architecture from Virginia Tech, which he also collaborates with educators at. Um, during my internship, during my internship, uh, there, during my internship, I worked with uh, the software Revit, which was, which is very helpful as it is both easy to use and very efficient in creating architectural designs. Um, I learned to use many different techniques and different ways of creating more, uh, creating um, architectural plans. It was, it was kind of fun just like playing around with it, honestly. Like I found like just making a bunch of different shapes and like, cause that's a lot of what in architecture is taught to you is that sort of how to use form and shape and how to sort of think about it when you are creating a design. I found that very interesting. Um, the other part of my internship was sort of just learning directly with Mr. Riggs where I, he taught me a lot about um, like architect, like thinking about architectural design and sort of the process of how it goes. It's um, a lot of architectural design is, a lot of architectural design, sort of the, it's, it can be a philosophy and a process. Like there's a lot to think when going into architectural design. And also it's a very large scale process. There's a lot of parts, moving parts when thinking about, you know, what goes where, what shape, how, like how to make this into a sort of a, the shape you want. And yeah, it was very interesting just sort of talking with them. I mean, like I found a lot of fun just sort of like asking him questions and sort of getting very long responses that I just sort of absorbed and noted down over time. So uh, yeah, I really enjoyed my internship with him. Um, as for my community service, I worked with Habitat for Humanity. Um, they built homes for those that cannot afford them or like have a hard time affording them. So I worked with them to, uh, you know, since I wanted to do something in affordable housing. Um, these are my internship mentors, uh, Joe Morgan and Donald Kuntz, both who work for Habitat and play influential ro roles in the organization itself. Um, I approached them initially with my idea of affordable housing and they gave me the opportunity, specifically with architecture, and they had actually just had a new design for a new type of house because how Habitat for Humanity works is how Habitat for Humanity works is basically they make the same design every time it's like so they don't need you know to know rethink the whole process that's already there they have the plan and so they just you know use their volunteer labor force to you know make the same design and they know all the ins and outs of it but Recently, they tried to make a new, a bit more expensive, but also a bit nicer of a house. And what happened is, is that during this process, they actually, um, some of the architectural plans for this house was actually, um, they, there were some mistakes and some flaws in the design. And so I was brought in to help with that. So as you can see here, the, this is the original plan that was done on paper. Um, if you can see here, the several of the bedrooms do not only have like one window, and it's very important to have light 
coming into a room and lighting up the house because that saves on energy costs for lighting. And so you can see here there, there's only one or so, uh, very few windows. Also, a lot of narrow corridors, especially in this bathroom. There's a, it's very small when, um, when you go in there. So because I initially, when I went to them, I went on the plot, they to I toyed around, I found things very interesting about the differences between their normal kind of house and this new kind of house and seeing the differences. Um, I, excuse me. Oh yeah. I wanted to, and this is also gives you a good, um, just like sort of view of the side of the house and sort of like, what the what it looks like uh there's a side view and so in so sorry but essentially during my community service i worked with i continued to work with uh mr riggs but i um met mr Koontz and mr morgan on a regular basis to basically touch base with them on sort of what they wanted from the redesigns and sort of you know how they wanted to continue forward um we also i also played around with accessibility when sort of redesigning the house making it more accessible to those that you know may have accessibility issues so i came up with these three designs after after um making after base taking the original design and basically putting it into revit then i sort of i made the redesigns and this is what i came up with uh First of all, this this is the most minimalistic design over here. It just sort of um, it just sort of extends the bathroom, puts more windows in, and makes it, and just makes it a bit larger of a space, just to you know make more room for people who need it. This one is focused more on making the master bathroom more accessible, or the master bedroom too, and so. You see a lot, a bit more like moving around of stuff and making a bit more like accessible for like wheelchair accessibility. And then for this one, I, uh, this one was probably the most in depth just because like um, the thing with accessibility is it can be very hard. I'd learned this that it can be very hard to sort of balance, you know, affordability and like. Because there are a lot of um, regulations and such that needed to, like, um, you know, you need this amount of space clearance and within the um, room, like when opening doors and such. So that we was, and so that ended up being the, uh, the third design, which ended up being the most, you know, costly because that would take a lot more redesigning to do. Uh, eventually, and they settled on the most minimalistic, of course, but it, at the same time, even though those changes were small, they were very important to making the home as accessible and as, um, you know, just nice, because that's really at the end of the day what it needed to be was nice while being affordable. So at, this is what the end result became. You have a lot of... Um, you you, do, you have like the windows, you have larger spaces. The other great thing about Revit, and the most one of the significant thing I, things I found was that when reading the original plans, it was a lot harder to read since it was done on paper. And actually, one of the things I uh, that happened was um, midway between uh, translating the plans to the drawn plans to Revit. Actually, um, misread the measurements, so I had to sort of go back and fix those because um, they weren't like very well like written on the original version. So this with Revit, it's a lot clearer to read and a lot easier for the um, site manager or whoever to sort of understand the plans during construction. And here's a better view, a side view of the house itself in the uh, Revit. So. For my research, uh, I decided, since I was focused on affordable housing, I wanted to see how, how can the high cost of modern residential housing be curbed in order to provide low-income Americans with more affordable housing. So I came up with, there were plenty of uh, points along the 
sort of construction process that it can be made more affordable. I found three very important. First of all, design, so more sustainable design is very important as it prevents uh, long-term costs in terms of keeping and maintaining the house. Um, also, the thing like using Revit for the design itself, like that can be very um, much more efficient than like drawn plans and like it allows for like, you know, bringing, if you ever need to redesign the plans, you can just go into the file and just like, you know, touch up things whenever needed. Um, labor is also important. Like I, th I uh, found that uh, that's why Habitat uses a volunteer labor force is because volunteer can, uh, labor can get very expensive over time depending on how many people you need for the job. So I found that reduced or, you know, volunteer labor force is best to, if, if labor is needed at all. And finally, the process, I actually uh, found real, something really interesting that my um, internship mentor um, is currently researching is prefabrication, which is essentially where chunks of a house are essentially built in a factory with all the plumbing and wiring and, and basically all built on sort of an assembly line, which both saves on, and, and once that chunk is finished, it's sort of taken to the site and all put together rather than having to build it on site because that because if it's done in that way it can save on labor which is uh, you know a very costly can be very costly and also it can save on materials which normally need to be shipped out to the location itself whether and instead it can just be used in the factory itself oh another one of the probably the most significant thing I found in my research is uh, three statistics. First of all, the high cost of housing has reached in America about over five hundred thousand um, dollars, which is very staggering compared to the sixty thousand average annual income in America. Which means that housing has become way too expensive for the for you know the average American's income. Also, I found that the total number of people experiencing house, uh, homelessness in America has reached to almost 600,000, with uh, many being uh, families and veterans too. Um, and, but what probably staggered me most of all was the mortality rate. Um, this showed that people experiencing homelessness were much more likely to die if um, they weren't housed compared to the even people housed and even people poor in house, which just shows the effectiveness and how necessary a home is to life itself. There you go. So the significance of my project, I would say, is that um, basically. Uh, being able to redesign a, a this house has will help hopefully help um, habitat in the future with um, you know with making this house again and also for the people who will live in this type of house in the future making it uh, nicer and um, more comfortable to live in. Uh, also, uh, habitat has recently. Um, interested in getting a three-year license for Revit, which will allow them to make, which will allow them to design architectural architectural plans a lot faster and a lot more efficiently, which also saves on cost. And I intend to continue working with them to help them with that and help them sort of learn how to use it so they can continue using them themselves when you know I go off to college. For my future plans, I intend to attend the University of Virginia, where I will study architecture at the School of Architecture. And I, I don't know exactly what major I will be going into in terms of architecture, but I do, but I do plenty that I can choose from. And as for future, as, as for past that, I intend to become an architect. Although I don't know exactly what kind of architect I'll be, but I have learned that. 
you can basically specialize in anything in the architectural field as an architect. So I'm excited to see where that leads me, and so I hope to you know, find that out in the future. So if I were to reflect on my project, I would say that the one thing I learned a lot was that people aren't that scary. Like I've found that, uh, especially with my internship mentor, I connected him with him a lot, and you know we have so we developed sort of a more like um, not as much of like a like a professional sort of like scary like relationship, but more of just like a you know a getting to know each other kind of relationship. And I feel like you know going into talking to other people can be very hard at first, but once you get to know them, you really sort of you know, you can really connect with them if you find something to connect over. Um, and advice I would give to future Blue Ridge students would be, I would say, try and get it, get your project done as early as possible. Try and work on it. Try and I, because I started a bit late, so in retrospect, I would probably want to start a bit earlier again. And I would also say, find some, like, when choosing your project, I would say try and find something that interests you because. Whether you like it or not, it, it's still a learning experience for both what you research and what you in about yourself and how you relate to that interest. Thank you. Yes. Can you speak to that a little bit? Like, did, did you find that in your work was the intent of the mentor? Yes and no. I found that it definitely plays a role into sort of like, because the thing, when I talked to Mr. Riggs about sort of learning about more about architecture, I actually found that um, a lot of the sort of math or like engineering side a lot of that can be delegated to other like engineers and such, and so that gives a lot more freedom to the architect to sort of focus more on how they want to shape the overall structure itself and like how they want the project to look. So it, def it definitely plays a role into it, but um, I think for learning architecture that like, um, I know at UVA specifically, they sort of teach you from the ground up so you don't really need to have an art background when like so if you're at least going into learning it, because you'll probably be taught all that when you go in.
Any questions? No. Awesome. Okay. All right. Help me welcome Kate. Hello everyone, I'm Chase Null and my project is on the importance of quality in industrial design. A little bit of background, I've grown up doing art my entire life, drawing, sketching, all of the above, and I thought that I wanted to have a career in a field dominated by art, and so I decided to take up an internship over last summer in industrial design. I decided to work with Spark Product Development, which is a company in Richmond that Jacob mentioned earlier. I actually had no idea that he had done something there. And during my time there, I, sp I spent a total of 120 hours there over the course of the entire summer. My mentors were Jonathan Kite, Chris Murray, and Bruce Ferris, with Bruce being my main contact, and he, I was, I originally reached out to him through connections that I had with a couple other companies from my parents' old work, and because of that, I was able to get an internship fairly quickly, and while I was there, Jonathan Kite and Chris Murray were very, very good mentor, mentors to me, and Originally, I was expecting to be working under Bruce Ferris. However, when I got there, uh, the, the place I ended up working was in the design, I guess, department, which is, they ha the office is laid out with the bottom floor, just there's an engineering room, which is all the machines and all the woodworking stuff. And then there, next to that is the main office. And then above that is where I was working with Chris and John. And there, while I was up there, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the other mentors, the two dogs that were at the office, uh, Mr. Black and River, which I didn't get to spend much time with Mr. Black, sadly, but River was pretty much always by my side throughout the internship. But uh, while I was there, I got to test many products. I can't go into too many details on most of them, but for this one here, a company sent in a Christmas tree that is essentially, it's a telescopic pole with Christmas lights attached to it that you had to stake into the ground. And they wanted us to rec reduce the cost of production I wasn't there for the for the finale of this project, sadly, but we got to we had to build a base for it because the company didn't send us one with it. And you can see me and a couple of the other people working there trying to make this makeshift thing. And on top of like on top of this project, I got to work on one with a sensor for if you've ever if you've ever heard of like dog food factories or anything like that they have tons and tons of dust everywhere and when that dust gets piled up if there's a single spark it can all explode and so i got to work on a sensor that was supposed to like make like i guess sound an alarm whenever too much dust piled up for them to clean it and during that test, during that product test, I got to drop a ball of tungsten onto it from various heights, which eventually caused a little explosion, which I will say was pretty funny. But here is, this is my workspace while I was there. I worked on, I primarily worked on a project for a company called Gridpoint, which the, they make temperature sensors and thermostats and other things for generally public buildings such as schools, hospitals, government facilities, all those kinds of buildings. And I was working on a temperature sensor down here and also the main, the main unit, which this is the circuit board for the main unit right here, that I learned how to CAD model while I was there. 
here are my sketches for each of, each of the iterations for the design of the final products that the company look, would look over our sketches and our very rough ideas and choose essentially like a branch of ideas like these two were some of the earliest ones that I came up with that they didn't make it very far. This one made it to the late design stage before we ended up canceling it because they ended up leaning towards this design. And then from that design, I ended up getting to model it, which took a lot longer than I'd like to admit. But actually, with this model, I actually got to 3D print it. This is a very scaled down model, but you'd like to pass it around. It's supposed to be around four or five times that size, and it would be placed on a hospital wall or basically the wall of any building with a grid point thermostat system. And that would essentially relay like the signals from each thermostat to regulate the temperature in the building. And of course, this is not the full model. There would be the circuit board inside of it, as well as antennas sticking off the side. As you see back here, there's the three antennas. But you can't see them too well, but each one has its own uh, specific purpose. Not quite sure what the purpose is, but it's there. But that brings me to my research, which is how does the quality of product design influence cons consumer behaviors related to the reuse and recycling of products? Right now, I want you to think of how much, like any time you see trash on the side of the road or you have clothes that no, either no longer fit you or just have holes in them, rips, tears, anything like that. How much of that is stuff that if it, you had used it, you would have wanted to use it for much longer? brings me to what happens to all of those clothes that you can't use, that you don't think you can use anymore. 19% of all of your clothes that you end up getting rid of are burned and are essentially just turned into poison for our atmosphere. 66% of your clothes that you don't reuse are going to end up in landfills, and that is including any kind of clothes you've ever owned. Only 15% of your clothes ends up being recycled, whether, and that includes donations, that includes your like clothes that are turned back into fabric to be used for more clothes or even to be quilted, anything like that. Only 15%. So there is a much, much too much waste of like just our clothing items. Because of this, I decided to work with Goochland, Goochland Cares in the clothes closet with, with Rhonda Weaver to collect donations and sort them to see which ones really can't be used to any further purpose. So far, I haven't had enough time to do too much with them. However, I have been, I have been picking up donations and working in the clothes closet for a few weeks now and it really is astonishing how many how much clothes or how many clothes people just discard because around 90% of the donations that I've gone through so far have been in perfect or like perfect condition the only issue with them is maybe they need a slight wash or need to be ironed here you can see the clothes closet in Goochland Cares. It's very well maintained, it's very nice, and it's also very cheap. So you, there's, no, like, there's no reason for people not to be shopping here. In my time at Goochland Cares, I haven't, again, I haven't had too much experience here yet. However, I, I've been donating there for a few years when I have clothes that either no longer fit me or are just something that 
I bought and would not be willing to wear that I didn't want to return and have someone pay the same price for it when I could give it to someone who needs it more. So I've been donating for a long time. However, I plan on continuing working there as a volunteer for the foreseeable future. Looking back on my project, I think my biggest, my biggest reflection is I realized during this project that I don't actually want to pursue industrial design. As interesting as it is and as like amazing of a profession as it is to me, I think that pursuing a career in something I am so like pursuing a career in art that I have treated as a hobby my entire life and I've spent countless hours doing, I believe having a career in that would take away the value of having that hobby and it would make it less enjoyable for me as a whole. However, due to this discovery and also the influence of my dad, I have learned that I want to go into computer science and I plan on pursuing that in the future because of my dad creating this app, Truthify, over, I believe it was over uh, quarantine that he began development on it with a friend of his. And he got a patent for a technology that essentially analyzes the muscles in your face you can't control. So it can analyze the emotions you express without knowing it. And you, will wa you can watch a video and it will tell you exactly what you felt throughout the video or tell the person who sent it to you exactly what you felt. Now, it is currently being used for advertising platforms here and there. It's not super widespread yet. However, the patent for motion recognition technology did belong to my dad until he sold it. And honestly, because of that, I am very, very interested in computer science. Because it's only, this is only achievable through that. Back to the future plans, I'm currently looking towards Dartmouth and Carnegie Mellon, although I have yet to hear back from either. I have had an interview with Dartmouth recently, and I believe it went well. And with any luck, I end up at one of those two. Thank you. things on before you commit to them and invest money in pursuing them, right? So I love that you learn your business career. Um, I'm interested, as you share the different designs, the, the sketches that you did of that thermostat, do you know what factors influence which design model they kind of went with? Was it the aesthetics? Was it the functionality? I, I do. So the ultimately they did not this was not the final one they ended up going with but it was in the final round of design decisions because i forgot to mention this earlier but it wasn't i was not the only one coming up with ideas for this product there me and the other two industrial designers there were working we were all working separately towards the same goal and we came up with i think it was a total of around 50 ish designs for this before like these are only six out of the I want to say 20 or so that I designed and we essentially every round we would submit all of the ones that we came up with and then they would and then the company would choose like four that they really liked four unique ones and then from those we would come up with different variations of them and then if they chose another, when they chose another more specific one of those, we would pursue that. And from then on, we, I think we did five rounds and then they chose the final one, which was, I don't have a picture of it, sadly, but it was similar to this one. However, it had rounded edges all the way around. And the purpose for, like, the reason why they chose one specific one over all the others was because the idea they want, or they wanted to convey very little. They didn't want it to be something that sticks out to the eye. Like, if someone saw, if someone sees a thermostat and is, like, averse to it or something, it could 
cause issues. Like if it's in a hospital, it ca could cause someone to be distracted walking down the hall, cause some kind of issue. That's, I mean, that's the reason I was given for it, but basically it's, it comes down to aesthetics for the most part. So like if you're editing your slideshow, then you just slide it almost down. So that's how you can remember again. So you can go back, go back. Just the wrong direction. So no, it's just the coding. It's only once if it's directly on the screen. So if you try to do it anywhere else, on the TV, on the phone, on the screen, mm -hmm. or anything, it's not the decision. Yeah. So just share it with other people. If you can't believe what you say. Take a breath, take a breath, and just share it, okay? Last thing said, in between the two tapes, and that's just to help you push your face the audience so that we can see you, right? Okay. See your back, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay, any questions for me? Um, no. Okay, let's do your best. Please help me welcome Jen. <laughs> Hello, my name is Genesis Ray, and I decided to do my senior capstone product project. Project, there we go. On the impact of therapy animals on mental health. Oh, there it goes. So for why I chose my topic, it was more of a personal reason for me because I know people who have been struggling with mental health, myself included. During COVID, I was diagnosed with anxiety and I had to take Prozac for it, hence the picture of Prozac. And I wanted to help other people like me who struggle with their mental health, because even though the Prozac helps a lot, I could be helped more. Like there's still some edges that could be smoothed over a bit more. So for my research question, I decided to ask, how can animals be useful to those with mental health issues, especially combined with therapy? And there's a little picture of a therapy dog. Sadly, I was not able to get a clear picture of the therapy dogs we have here, as we know them, Tide, Cole, and occasionally Mark, if anybody remembers Mark. So my mentor for both my internship and my community service was Ms. Renee Farrell. She is one of the um, school counselors for those of the last names between P to Z, I believe. And she also is the main handler for Cole and also helps out with Tide when Ms. Lawson is busy with other things. For my community service, I was mainly helping out around the office for the guidance counselors, doing things like shredding extra papers, organizing files, and more recently, handing out awards that were meant to be handed out during the award ceremony at the beginning of the year. But for whatever reason, we're not able to make it to who they belong to on that specific day. Oh, I overlaid that the wrong way. That is supposed to be a picture of all the shredded pictures all the shredded papers I have. Like they're in big bags, there's a lot of them. Oh, there it is, right, okay. I forgot I did that. For my community service impact, I'm planning on giving out a Google form to all the people who work in the department I was helping out. I probably should have added a picture of what it looks like. But I was going to ask on a scale of 1 to 10, how have I impacted their day-to-day -day? from the months of September, which is when I began this, 
to, I'm predicting I should probably be done with all my community service around early to mid-April. Well, not early April, because we're not here the first week of school. So mid-April, probably, because I'm not fully done with my community service just yet. And also asking if I've impacted them positively or negatively, and have they been able to do anything productive with the free time I have offered them by doing the more boring tasks around the office, like filing and shredding papers. For my future plans and what I have learned, this has taught me that um, I do not really want to do anything involved with psychology like I thought I did when I first started this project. But after like halfway through the project, I discovered that I really like tap dance of all things. Where's the picture? There's the picture. So I'm thinking of going to college with a major in dance. I'm not sure which college to go to yet, but I am thinking of contacting the University of Richmond. And as for my advice to future Blue Ridge students doing this project, oh, my main advice is to figure something out quickly and act on it quickly. Because you never know if you might lose an idea to someone else who had a similar thought process. They don't seem to be in here right now, but Sam also worked with Ms. Farrell and took the main idea I'd had when we first started talking about the internships and, oh, I forgot to talk about my internships. Oh, okay. So for my internship with Ms. Farrell, I mainly sat in on some of the non-confidential meetings that she had. And also I got to learn a bit about the other things that she does aside from helping seniors and other students with their um, schedules. Click, please. Okay, any questions? I'm interested if you have any um, more information to share about the impact of therapy on the individual, like how they're used or the benefits. Well, I've learned that there are not only a lot of benefits to therapy animals, like helping with anxiety, depression, and ADHD, but there's also different types of therapy you can use animals for. The main two are canine therapy, which is the one everyone's familiar with, and equine therapy, where instead of dogs, you use horses, which I believe is mostly helpful for anxiety and also for those who either aren't comfortable with dogs or those who are allergic to them. Thank you. That wasn't too bad. That wasn't too bad on the thing. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Yep. All right. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you.
in between those two okay. lines. That line's kind of hard. Can you see between those? Okay. Okay. All right. Ready for two? No. Thank you. Help me welcome Alex. Good morning. My name is Alec Burnett, and my topic is focused on engineering and construction in the community. Oh, oh, all right. <laughs> all right, for my why, my why has always been like, Getting to see these big machines, like those machines that are 10 times as tall as people are, especially when, since I was a little kid, it's always get the cool to be able to go see stuff like that. And then pictured here is like an even bigger loader than those trucks that weigh several hundred tons and a single person's driving, but you need to climb 30 stairs to get up there. So when I was given the opportunity at the beginning of last summer to go work by my mentor, Mr. Raymond Slaughter, who I met through the robotics team, I, he gave me the opportunity to go work at Luxton, so I decided to take that because I wasn't exactly sure how it would lead into my project, but I decided that it would be a good starting point and it would be a great way to jump off. And so when I got there, I learned that they're, they were in the middle of migrating what's called the Atlanta plant, which was purchased about three years ago. This plant was built by somebody who, he kind of founded the company and built the plant at the same time, so the plant grew as the company needed it to, which meant that it was not aligned with how Luxton typically builds plants. And so the current task for the engineering department was to basically redesign and rebuild the entire plant, but you can't take this plant offline. This plant has to stay online for the eight months while you're building because it's too valuable to the company. And so that meant that the majority of my task was working with him and around him on the small tasks that they were uh, completing throughout the day. And so the entire construction of the new plant was contracted out to a contractor in Alabama because they're local to the site. And then half of the design was done by Luxton in-house and the other half was done by the contractor. Um, so for my work, I, majority of my work is focused on this transfer tower right here. This transfer tower is used to redirect fines or dust down these two paths because fines are generally considered a problem in the mining industry. They're hard to get rid of and nobody wants them, which means that you have to deal with them yourself. So that was designed to allow you to stack them in two different places on the site, depending on what exactly was needed for the company that day. Pictured over there are just some of the massive super stackers they use. Those are over 150 feet off the ground over there. And so pictured here, that's a shaker deck, and that is a crusher. Crushers crush the rock, and shaker decks shake it out and sort it out. And so as part of redesigning the plant for a Luxstone to be a Luxstone plant, we had to separate out the sections of the plant because plants typically use what's called a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary plant. And together they make up the whole plant. And so Luxstone builds their plants by having a massive what's called a surge pile, which allows you to deposit the rock out of each plant into a pile that has a conveyor running out of it that'll feed into the next set of plants. And so at a typical Luxstone plant, you will the primary plant will run when the during the day shift from about AM to 5 p.m. or so. That'll run during that time, and then that gets shut off when people leave. The secondary and tertiary typically don't start up until 1 p.m., and they'll go until 1 a.m. fully autonomously. And so that, these surge piles allow Luxstone to run their plants that way, and the maintenance can be done by the day shift at a favorable time, and they provide a better avenue for working on it. And so that was all part of the Atlanta redesign project. But one thing that I found, or one thing I was asked to do during my internship was to redesign and assist with the dust suppression of an output of a crusher at the current Atlanta plant, the one that was being replaced. And so that crusher was producing too much dust. It was falling into the air. And actually, this plant is so close to the Atlanta airport that it was causing problems at the airport. So I had to redesign that system because the old system, it was put together by the miners. And they do things fast, not always right, which meant that they were just dumping hoses of water onto the belt. And so that meant that the dust was building up, getting wet, and causing essentially a brick in the system. And you could have that brick cause clogs later down the line. And especially because it's on the output of a crusher, it'll go straight into a screen, and that's, that brick can actually punch holes through the screen. And so my job was to redesign the suppression on the output of that system. And so I was told by Mr. Slaughter to just use water jets that spray at like a flat fan kind of spray. And so I used three of those, but that made me curious about what other alternatives were, which led me to my research question, which are what are the best ways to reduce dust emissions from a mining plant? So I found a couple different ways. 
Uh, these are two pictured. That one focuses on transfer sites, such as where you're dumping into a conveyor. And so that focused on using a shelter over the top as well as curtains in the middle to stop the dust from flowing around. Because the curtains will fall out of the way of rock, but they will get blocked by the, or the they'll block the dust. And over here is just using a tire stop and water sprays over the top to expand the effective area of the, of the tire stop while preventing the dust from billowing back towards the operator. And so both of these are more focused on vehicle use cases, which are better and makes, means that the original does not have to be 100% effective because vehicles have air filters. But if you're, it, doesn't protect, it fails to protect the outside environment and it fails to protect any workers who are walking by without their own respiration equipment. And so there was a couple, there's a couple more effective options, such as um, like fully, essentially fully encasing the plant. It's similar to that, but then there's an air system that pulls the dust out and then runs it through filters. Those are very expensive. And then one actually really interesting one was it's essentially water sprays, but on top of the water sprays, you impart an electrical charge on the water that you produce, and it makes it more effective at gathering dust out of the air. So I'd actually seen something similar to this at Luxstone. Most Luxstone plants are built such as this, where there's a um, large covering essentially over the entire shaker deck, and it reduces the dust emissions of the shaker deck. And so I actually realized that later, I realized that's why they did that uh, during my research. As for my community service, I worked with Habitat for Humanity on to put to use the more structural side of the work I did at Luxstone, which was focused on getting these 150 ton machines into the air because wind is strong and it's not easy. And so I worked with them to do, to aid in the like planning and construction and layout of their new houses for this year. And so with them, we have laid out both the sites, the site for the house for this year and next year to help them plan and help them apply for permits because you can't do anything on a site until you get your building permit. And then we also worked to assess the amount of lumber that would be required to build the current houses to help help them in planning. And then we're also, we haven't gotten, gotten to do it yet, but we're going to go build a shed to help them plan and set up for the construction. And, and I, when I look back on this project and do my, let's see what I grew through, I found that it was actually really good to be able to spend an eight, work an eight hour day at a, at an, basically an engineering firm because it's within Luxon, it's basically an engineering firm. And I really enjoyed that. I got to see more of the company and feel what it would be like to work it, because to work an eight hour day as an engineer. Because what I plan to do is actually go to college for electrical engineering, even though most of the stuff I did was mechanical. And similar to some of the other presentations today, I found that I want to keep mechanical stuff as a hobby so it's more enjoyable for myself and then I can have electrical stuff to be what I want to do uh, for a career. And looking back on this project, I did not expect this whole project, and especially my research question, to come out of that internship, just working at Luxton for a summer. Um, I didn't think there was so much behind the dust. I thought you just put a machine in the air and it runs away, and you don't look back at it, but there's a lot behind it. And so I found that all of this was quite different. It was more than I expected, and so I would definitely say just if you get an opportunity to take it, because you never know where it will take you. As for my future plans, uh, I plan to attend either Virginia Tech or UVA for electrical engineering. I am not sure which yet, um, and I really haven't had much time to think about it. Any questions? So, not particularly. Um, I got to, the design team is one row of cubicles over from the electrical engineering team at Luxstone though, so I got to see some of what they do. But they're a lot more focused on big power stuff and I want to do signaling stuff, so it's a little bit different. Obviously, this to start with kind of the, the idea, I like big trucks. Yeah. <laughs> like every three-year-old does. Yep. Take it to me electrifying the water to reduce the
this is just gonna go right here. So we're gonna be recording. Yeah. Mm. Um, you hold it the louder you are. Raise it where I can hear it. Because I wanna hear what you have to say. And if you're in between those two, take one. Okay. And you're gonna put it facing the audience. Obviously, you wanna see you without your back. Um, the down is next. Okay. Um, just think of like when you edit your slide, should go down to the next slide. So down. This is back. Okay. If you push the wrong one, just push the other one. Yeah. We all saw that. So no big deal. Um, and then just put the pointer. It has to be head on, like the TV, so it doesn't work right from the angle. So probably just point. Okay. Um, remember to breathe. Right. Our brain can't function without oxygen. So if you get stuck. Nobody will notice, and then don't cry. Are you proud of what you did? Mm -hmm. Share that story. And all of you work really hard, and I'm just terrible about that. Any questions for me? No. I'm going to be sitting over there. If the clicker doesn't work, I will, I will help with that. Okay. All right. Oh my gosh. Please help me welcome Bailey. So, for my project, I mainly focused on from my overall topic. I have always been uh, I have always been interested in computers and how they function and what technology is used throughout day to day life. And so I really wanted to look at the information technology aspect, which is really the overarching aspect of just technological support with many different subsections, one of which being cybersecurity. And for my research question, I looked at the most effective strategies and technologies that people use for being safe, as well as how to practically implement said strategies and technologies. I really wanted to focus on the cybersecurity aspect but with the main requirements of this project, I realized that um, not many places, not many cybersecurity places uh, do internships, as well as it can be very difficult to just do a, just do community service with cybersecurity as it being a very niche uh, aspect of technology. So with research, I the question isn't a super open-ended. So the question, while it is open-ended, is not, there's not a, there's no yes or no answer, but there's also not a very complicated answer, as there are already technologies and strategies that are used as uh, Know Before is a online course that is actually implemented here at Goochland High School that is taught by, that uh, Peter Martin teaches. And, but when it comes to researching cybersecurity and answering the question, there's a lot of basic terms that are needed as well as the history of major cyber attacks and different types of attacks because different strategies don't work with every type of virus that hackers use to access personal information. Um, my mentor for my internship is uh, Peter Martin, who is the director of technology here at Goochland. And for my community service, my mentor is Madeline Dettens, who is the special ed department chair here at Goochland High School. Because of both of their positions, I was not able to work with them as much as I would like to, especially Peter Martin. He, because he works with all of Goochland, he is very much ev traveling everywhere, not always at Goochland High School at the help desk or just at central office. So I mainly worked with, during my internship, Henry Pace and uh, Mike Origi. And then for my community service, um, I worked with Mrs. Parker's uh, special ed class. 
and taught them internet safety. For my internship, the first couple of days, I started in late September. For the majority, for the first half, I was mainly just observing. I unfortunately started right after this huge wave of people who had issues. It, all of their problems were fixed, so I came in at possibly the worst time when it came to interning. But when it comes, to, when, especially with IT in this situation, is very feast or famine. Some days are very slow and almost no one has any issues. And, and other days, it is the entire day just nonstop issues of either broken computers, just uh, ad blockers that they set up or filters that they set up. Sometimes it there's a minor issue that completely screws over everything. And so for the most part, I was I for the at least for the very beginning, I was just watching uh, computer repairs here. Henry is working on, I believe he's replacing a battery as well as a screen because a student had broken their screen by closing their laptop on a rock. So here, near the end of the uh, internship, uh, <clears throat> near the end of the internship, we are now starting to replace the older computers that the junior, current juniors and seniors have. So from sophomore down are fairly new computers, but they are going, we are going to replace the, the ones that the juniors and seniors have, which are the 2017 MacBook Air, I believe. And while, do, while going through this, we do plan on selling the ones that are active. We plan on wiping them, uh, getting completely factory resetting them, getting rid of all information on it and selling them. But for a lot of it, we, we have a lot of computers and so it, my main job was going through and making sure what was wrong with it and labeling if, uh, like if it had a cracked screen or if there was liquid inside the computer. And if it didn't turn on, seeing what, opening it up and seeing what we could salvage off of it to either store for future repairs because the juniors are not going to be getting new computers next year. So we do need to save as many parts because within the first two weeks of school, we ended up blowing through 90% of the technology budget because of so many students coming in with broken parts. For my community, for my community service, here I am working with Ms. Parker's instructional assistance and helping them with because they are when it comes to technology they know the bare minimum and so i am w seeing what they want to know more and essentially creating a cheat sheet for them to look at so while they are working with the students they are also able to help them with what they need and so i am currently in the process i've already done a couple lessons but i am working with the students and going through a course on basic internet safety so that when they graduate high school, they aren't going into the wild and being susceptible to everything out there. During this entire process, I realized that my uh, being in, working in IT is, this environment is so different because the, ha, sometimes you have to deal with people that just go in and say, my computer's broken. And solving the issue is not the hard part, it's figuring out the issue. And when, the, and when people just come in and say, my computer doesn't work, and then you take it apart and find out that they spilled Coke all over it and there's still water inside, there, it becomes very frustrating. And then they come back in two hours seeing if the computer's already fixed, in which everything about it is 
kaput. You, there's nothing you can salvage from that. So also the just overall in vibe that I had with Henry and Mike was just very relaxed and just we got what needed to get done. And when we had time, we just enjoyed that time because when push came to shove, there was a lot we were doing the entire time. I would, uh, Henry and I were making hardware repairs while Mike had to make sure that the filters weren't completely ruining every, all of the computers. And so overall, this was just a very enjoyable experience. And I plan on continuing to work with them for as long as I can. Also, teaching kids, I've never taught before. I have never taught, and that was a huge struggle for me, especially with kids that learn a very specific way, and you have to be very patient with them. Overall, I would say definitely choose a very broad topic and narrow it down as you go. I initially started with just doing my project based on cybersecurity, and I found out that, as I said before, there is Honestly, with what the project required, there was not much I could do with cybersecurity alone. So I decided to broaden it and do the overall importance of IT. And for advice for future Blue Ridge seniors, find what you enjoy. Even, even if you think that it is not going to be super impactful, do what you enjoy. It is so much easier to create a research paper and create a website and slideshow around what you want to do. It doesn't even have to be what you want to go into as a career. Just if you enjoy it, do it. I plan on, I got in, accepted into George Mason and JMU and VCU, but I plan on going to VCU to study in cybersecurity. That's it. Any questions? No. Not at all. It, the only time it's predictable is start of school year. That's it. Is, is the very start because you might get people that their computer just needs to be charged and they didn't charge it long enough. So they're coming in saying that their computer doesn't work. And then we plug it in and it turns on. Um, and it is very, a lot of minor problems. And then also, they, we are constantly adjusting the ad blocker and filter, uh, especially because sometimes uh, when it comes down to the biggest problem is when, if it just comes out as ads, as in when a student clicks on a website, if it has too many pop-up ads, the filter will block it but sometimes that website is very useful and it's just a minor ad blocker that needs to be implemented. So there are a lot of test, there are a lot of test groups. I am, my laptop is on a couple of the test groups, but sometimes it works for that one website and then they send it out and it completely shuts down everything else. Uh, I do remember a couple days ago, they were adjusting the filter and I wasn't able to access my own Google Sites website because it classified it as explicit content. So, so that, that can be an issue sometimes. Oh, Duncan and then Hannah. I didn't know that was blocked, but I will bring that to them. Sometimes 
they just don't know about problems. Like that's just not a thing until someone brings it up. So yeah, don't, that goes to my point of, or brings me to a point of don't be afraid to bring stuff to them. If you think there's something wrong, tell them. But also, if you know what's wrong with it, or if something happened to the computer, do tell us because it helps us figure out what is wrong. Uh, the help desk for the high school is for both middle school and high school, because we work on laptops and iPads. Um, a com I wouldn't say there were, I wasn't personally there, but while working on uh, one of the computers that we just needed to salvage, uh, the exposed picture, I didn't, that was essentially what it looked like. That was what I was given. No screen, no back cover to it, no battery. It was just the motherboard and, a li and just a little bit more things, and that was it. There was not even a trackpad. And that was a student's computer that they had brought in. And so obviously we had to give them a new one. But yeah, so I've, I've seen student laptops with names on them that are from seniors of this year. And it's rough. Hmm. Oh no, I, as I said, I wasn't there. It was many years, it was many years ago that they brought it in and it was just, it was like that. And oh, the screen was all, the, I wish I had gotten pictures of it because the charging port, as well as the USB, one of the USB ports was slanted like this. It was fully messed up. I, it was bent in a way I thought the battery, before I checked if it was there or not, I thought the battery had expanded, which is very bad. But it, yeah, it was rough. We have fun moments in there. All right, guys, we're going to take a break for lunch. Um, the seniors that have not presented today need to go first. Judges get to go first, obviously, judges. And then the seniors that have not presented yet today and then those that have presented today, and then the seniors from yesterday. Yes, Maggie. Oh, we are going to take a picture. So yeah, let's take all of the all of the seniors that are presenting today. Please come up and take a picture. You don't want that one. No, I want. So this way, the people watching know that we. I know, but you're taking a picture. Oh, you, okay, but you're taking a picture. That's why I did the other one. Um, right. Let me get this one up first, and then okay. I'll go back to it. Okay. So this is just for the recording. Yeah. This one, the closer you hold it, the louder you'll be. Okay. okay. So, so if it, if it test, test, right yeah. here. Okay. So we want to be able to hear you, but if it's like blasting. Hey. Okay. Hey. <laughs> All right. Down is next. So when you're editing <clears throat> your slideshow, you go down. So just okay. Check. You can test it out. And then the other way is back. Yeah, I got that. So if you, if you Laser. Yeah, it doesn't work if it's not Fair straight enough. on. Yeah. Um, if you push the wrong direction, it's okay. Just go the okay. right direction. <clears throat> Breathe. Your brain needs oxygen. Oh, I'm great. I'm I, great. I know. You're ready. I'm ready. Um, but if you need to pause, <clears throat> it's okay to pause. Yeah. Share your story. Um, we're asking you to stand in between these two lines. Of course. Can I walk around a little bit? You can walk around. Absolutely. But we'd like to I'm not a stationary speaker. I like to move, you know. Okay. Take, take the whole yeah. stage. Okay. Um, Can I walk in between the rows? And... No. I would prefer you to come. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then and then face the audience because we want to see you and not the back. Right? That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're gonna get started again, guys. Um,
um, help me well welcome Alex. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, before I start, uh, I want to thank Ms. Reard for being a really helpful supervisor to us all and giving us advice, resources, and just helping out us with this big project. It's really daunting, so thank you very much. <laughs> also, before I start, I just want to say, judges, you guys look lovely. <laughs> and I'm going to get into my project. So my name is Joseph Clark. I like to go by Alex, and this is my senior capstone project for 2024. So based off the title, you can kind of guess what I'm going to talk about. And I want to talk about the importance of media creation. But first, I'd like to define what media means. Media is just the collection and distribution of communication and information. So it's basically every possible channel of information and ideas that you can spread. And first, I want to talk about why I got interested into this topic. So in 2018, I was uh, 12 year, uh, 11 years old. I was at the beach, sunburnt. Everyone was outside on the beach, and I was super bored inside. I had nothing to do, and I turned on the TV. And uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was shaking hands with our president, Donald J. Trump, at the time. And I was like, why the heck is this on TV? I'm going to flip the channel, and then the next channel it's on. I was like, OK. And I flipped the channel again. Three channels in a row, the same broadcast is on. And so this really like captivated me because even when my parents and family came back from the beach, they started talking about this event as if they knew what happened, and they saw it on their phones. So the, the um, thought that an idea can be spread so fast and so rapidly is really cool to me. And like the spread of big ideas like this is what really captivated me to uh, uh, research this. And that's why I want to talk about my research question. Um, does the spread of media actually benefit our society? Um, so there's a lot of negative connotations around media with bias and data collection. But I really want to see if it actually helps us out. Is media important? Is it not? And that's what I chose to do with my research. So the first thing I did was I looked at the process in which you make media. And there's three phases, pre-production phase, production phase, and post-production phase. And so there's four steps. The first is conceptualization. This is where you make your idea. The next is development. This is when you plan on how you want to go about that idea. Production is the actual process of you doing it. And distribution is you spreading your idea to everyone in the world, or whoever you want to see. So a good example I'm going to give for this, it's a weird one. Imagine I was a teenage girl, and I just got a new dress, and I want to go to the beach and post pictures on Instagram. That's my idea. That's conceptualization. So then I make a plan. I'll get my younger sibling, hop in the car, drive to the beach, and he'll take photos of me, and I'll post them on Instagram. That's my plan. That is development. Now we go to production. This is where I actually drive to the beach, get my photos done. I look great. The new dress fits perfectly. And now it's time to distribute. And I go on Instagram, hit post, and there it is. But there is one step that I did not mention, and this is data collection. This is where I look to see who liked my post, who commented on it, things like this. And so data uh, collection in most media is really unethical because they do it without your permission. But some circumstances, it's allowed and it's viable. So all my friends said I look great and I'm happy. So what's the point? Why did I just tell you how media is made? Well, I told you this because now that you can understand this simple concept, which you probably already knew, you can imagine that everyone else in the world also has the ability to grasp the simple concept. And posting media online is very easy. Anyone can do it. And this is kind of harmful to our society, what most think, because they can post whatever they want on the internet and get away with it. So that's why I did research. And with my research, I tested multiple different age groups. First, I started with Bird Elementary School testing kids uh, with the newspaper club founded by Ms. Zoe Paris, the library media specialist. She takes care of all the elementary schools in Goochland County, so that's Bird, Randolph, and Goochland. And um, I saw the opportunity, and I instantly took it. I was like, that sounds great. I'm going to do that. And I joined this newspaper club. And then uh, for the more adult age group, um, this is a man at my church named Mike Shaner. Uh, he's very kind, and he's, he's grown to be one of my uh, cool friends at church. He's really awesome. And so what we do is every single week at church on Sunday, uh, we record our church sermon, post it on the Internet, so people who are unable to attend church can still enjoy it and be a part of our communion. Miss Bunovich over there is actually part of our church, and she can vouch for me on how close our community is. And the sense of community and like these old ladies who are unable to attend church after COVID, you know, 
and they still want to be a part of our community, they're able to do that through the internet. So it's great. So I want to talk about my service at Bird Elementary School. So what we did was every single Monday in early fall to uh, early, uh, I think it was December, yeah. Uh, what I would do is I'd go to Bird Elementary School. Some days I didn't miss, but I went around like six or seven times. And so what I would do was I would talk to these kids who had many ideas on what they wanted to put in the newspaper. The newspaper club gave fifth graders the opportunity to talk about what they want to and tell the other school and or tell the rest of the school, like all the other kids in the elementary school. And that's what we did. And so on the right, you can see here, um, one student wanted to talk about National Fire Prevention Week, which is really cool. So um, me and Miss Parrish helped bring that to life, and we made this poster, and it was a part of a little newspaper that we had. And here's me. And on the right, on the left side, sorry, it's my right, uh, you can see the uh, poll I made. I, I, they have iPads, so I got them to answer a Google form, and I wanted to see what media content was important to them and how it affected them. So a lot of them said, like, TikTok, that a lot of them used TikTok. There was 26 kids in total. Uh, the kids who said books were forced to read by their parents, and they also were the ones who said negative things about it because they don't like reading. But um, so mostly they have mixed reviews and mostly positive reviews. And now I want to talk about what I do at church. So every Sunday, um, I am a co I co run the uh, Facebook account, and what I do is since January I've been working with the church, and I put our live streams on Facebook. And this one was I did not post this one, but this is something we do. We post about what our community is doing, and these little kids. Um, and some adults helped make a breakfast for first responders, which was great. And so we're telling our community about that and just spreading the media, which is positive. And so now I want to get on to my mentorship. This was at Pavion, which sells audio and visual technology. And this is also with Mike again. So what I did with Mike was I would um, shadow him, and he was a salesman. So he sells these audio and visual systems to many people, like schools. He actually sold some to our church. He's a great guy, and I had a lot of fun. So the first day with Mike, I kind of went to his office, sat down with him, and just kind of talked to him. I watched him in a Zoom meeting. Uh, he made a phone call, just stuff like that. I wasn't there too long. And I've only started this internship in around early February, and it's going to last to the end of spring. And then he also offered for me to come there during the summer for a more professional internship, which I thought was really cool. And so we recently had a tech conference where I got, I didn't go, but Mike gave me this cool hat. I wasn't allowed to go because of like the stuff they talk about. And what they do is they talked about IT and stuff like that. And Mike uh, told me about what they talked about and this technology that they're using. And it's also very important to media creation, which is what I wanted to learn about. And so these audio and visual systems, this camera over here is a Marshall camera. We installed one of those in our church. And what they do is um, it's, just, it's just a normal camera, but it has the qualities to stream on the internet, which is really cool. It's not what we do. And so I learned a lot about technology and how it can be used in media creation through this internship. And Mike himself works in the 27th to 28th district of construction services, meaning he is the supplier for uh, these technology stuff. So that's what he does. And there's 33 in total. And so now I want to talk about my impact. So there is multiple different age groups. I want to see the impact that media had. And I did that with the elementary schoolers at Bird, the fifth graders, and some adults in my church. And so the adults at my church, I don't have qualitative information, or quantitative, but I do have qualitative information. Uh, they, most, they love it. They love the fact that they're able to check into the church. Uh, it's very great for them. And the kids themselves, uh, they, they love media, except for books. So that's kind of funny. And not very many of them had Instagram or Snapchat. And my legacy has already started. I am not doing anything for Bird, uh, the elementary school, after I graduate. But for my church, I have already taught the next people on how to do uh, my work and how to keep it going so they can keep live streaming and posting it on Facebook. And so here is my advice to all the upcoming seniors. Um, first things first, I'd like to say, of course, pick a topic you enjoy. I personally chose something that I wasn't very comfortable with, or not comfortable with, but it was out of my comfort zone, because I wanted to choose something that I wasn't too comfortable knowing about, and it was so it would be a learning opportunity, I could learn about it. And now I know about media creation, and I know that it's mostly beneficial for our society. That's what I learned, and my advice was that this presentation is the only scary part about this. 
And once you realize you're just talking to your classmates and three lovely judges, it's, it's much easier than it seems. And before, this is the ending. Before I get to the ending, my future plans, um, I'm either going to go into JMU for finance or I'm waiting on my Michigan and Georgia Tech responses and I'm going to do electrical engineering at those. And thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, thank great, you. Great job. Um, great surprising all you did. Um, I was interested in this newspaper club at yeah. Third Elementary. What grade levels were involved in that club? Was it, just it was only fifth graders in the club. So there was 26 fifth graders in total who wanted to join the club because on Mondays they had this free time and there's like clubs they can join, which is really cool. I didn't have that in elementary school. So it was mostly just fifth graders. Or it was only fifth graders, but the newspaper was the entire school could see it, and it was also posted on the Bird Elementary School website, so that parents could also see what the kids are doing. Yeah. Great, I love that. Uh, it was worried. I'm a little worried that they're on TikTok and Instagram and things like that. Yeah, I know TikTok's getting banned. It's yeah. there's a lot of bad stuff on it, and a lot of kids are, um, a lot of kids have access to it, and I think that's why it's being banned because it is starting to influence our younger generation, which that's why I was talking about. There is um, these things that are, everyone can post on the internet, and that can bring positive and negative effects, but I think it, from what my experience at uh, Bird Church and Bird Elementary School, it's mostly positive from what I've seen. Any other questions? Um, so with your experience with elementary school, what was the most surprising yeah. Yeah. About that. Mm -hmm. So, what was your what was your experience with the elementary uh -huh. school? Did you, oh man, like, should we be teaching them more and about how to deal with media and about it? Yeah, of course. I do think there should be more media literacy. Um, the elementary schoolers they mostly only watch like these. Excuse me. Um, they, they, the content they watch on TikTok and YouTube it's nothing to do with the real world. So I think they're relatively safe. They're in this bubble, sort of. But once they grow up, they need more. Me I do agree they need more media literacy. And maybe there could be like classes or that could be taught in the middle school because that's the one. I think that's the most crucial age group to hit just before high school, right after elementary school. But um, knowledge of the media is very important. There's lots of bad things on there, lots of bias. And it's, under it's important to understand what's on there and how to navigate it, yes. Any other questions? Thank you. Down is next. If you're editing your slideshow, the next slide's always down. That's how you remember down is next. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? You can go back, push the other, the up arrow. But if you push the wrong one, it's not a big deal. Just push the other direction, right? It's not a big deal. This only works if it's head on. It does not work on the side of the screen. So you can use the other probably is better than trying to use the really up arrow. Okay. Um, we would like you to stand in between those two lines and then. Facing towards the front, we don't want to see the back of you, so kind of like use that as like the angle you should stand at. Mm -hmm. um, most important, breathe. Your brain can't function without right, oxygen, right? right. Mm -hmm. So if you get stuck, take a deep breath. Nobody will notice, and you'll be able to go on. Okay. okay? Um, and we don't know what you're planning on saying, anyways. So whatever you say is fine. Right? There's no right or wrong here. Just share your story. Be proud of what you've done. Mm -hmm. And tell us about it. Is your chance to tell 
No, I don't. Good afternoon. My name is Rainer Schmitz, and for my senior project, I decided to focus on the importance of facilities in public education. And so, decent question is why facilities? So, I first began to realize the importance of facilities in our public schools last year when I did an Eagle project for the school where I designed and built a batting cage for the girls softball team. And during this project, I worked closely with Mr. Steely uh, and facilities to ensure that I was delivering a product that they wanted and that they would be able to use for years to come. And I later learned after finishing this that at the time, the school was actually at risk of a Title IX violation due to um, a difference in quality between the old batting cage for the girls softball team and the batting cage for the boys softball team. And had nothing been done, it was at risk of losing both teams. And this experience taught me that just the role that facilities can play in just keeping education running normally. And so when it came time for my internship, I reached back out to Mr. Steely, who is the head of facilities and maintenance at, uh, for Goochland Public Schools. And I began shadowing him. And while shadowing him, I learned various aspects of how uh, project management works with facilities, including uh, at the upcoming elementary school, though I never went there or assisted in any way there. Um, and I mostly went around and shadowed him, helped him with uh, completing work orders, such as um, replacing paper towel dispensers, as seen in this image, or uh, assembling tables. And in general, during my internship, just did those, uh, those types of activities. And additionally, as I was talking about project management before, uh, one of the methods of project management that I learned about was Gantt charts, which are useful ways of organizing tasks. And uh, they're listed based off of priority to the project, the dates that they need to be finished. And it just helps keep, make sure you're on track and you're completing what needs to be completed at the uh, appropriate times. And this is something that I intend to incorporate in a professional and personal project moving forward. And then additionally, as a side note, something that I found interesting is the incorporation of AI into various fields, including ones that you may not expect, just for easing menial tasks, such as, for an example, that Mr. Steely was using was incorporating AI to just write descriptions for job openings so that he could spend his time doing other important activities. And so moving on from my internship onto community service, uh, I returned a few months later to assist uh, with completing work orders for uh, Goodson County uh, public, school, uh, public School Facilities and Maintenance. And during this time, I assisted teachers. I assisted Mr. Steele most often. And for example, as seen in this photo, I assisted Mr. Birch with disassembly of drama stuff. I assisted him with reorganization of the drama backroom and uh, creating of set pieces. I additionally was given tasks such as assembly of assembly and transport of tables, as uh, seen in this photo, where I assembled tables, transported them to middle school, came back, rinse and repeat. And this one just transporting tables from the high school to middle school. Some more examples, filling in potholes in the parking lot, as seen in this image here, and disassembly of solar panel battery boxes. And then this was the final day of community service where I was, it was kind of a through line throughout my project uh, where towards the beginning I was prepping these pieces of metal for painting. Uh, towards the last day I came back and mounted them. And if you'll notice outside on the, uh, the entryway to school there is the school state champion sign. This is the mounting hardware for that. And so on to my research. I wanted to find out, uh, I wanted to demonstrate that there's a correlation between the quality facilities and the educational prowess of students and how quality facilities can affect students moving forward physically. And so to do this, I found a correlation by studying two documents. One was a, from the GAO, which was a congressional request on the state of facilities in 1995 to 1996. 
and a different congressional request for information to the National Center for Education Statistics, which found various educational statistics from school year 1969-1970 up through 1995-1996. To ensure that the uh, information was consistent with the two documents, I only focused on the information from 1995-1996 school year in the second document. And here the, uh, on the y-axis is inadequate building percentage. And what that refers to is the percentage of schools in each state that had at least one inadequate building, addition, or temporary building. And I compared that to the graduation rate in each state. And as you can see, typically, the more percentage of schools in an inadequate building had a lower graduation rate when compared to schools that have fewer inadequate, states with schools with fewer inadequate buildings. Some notable exceptions in case you notice them. Uh, in the school year 1995-1996, New Jersey and Illinois both had a graduation rate of above 100% which just means that the number of uh, enrolled students in 1995 was, uh, sorry, the graduating class exceeded the number of enrolled students in 1995. I'm not sure why this is the case. Oh, one more thing. So I also wanted to find out why, um, why this might be the case. And my research came to the answer of, a uh, big part of it is bad facilities often correlate to loud facilities, which is a major distraction for students and uh, is one of the major parts of why, uh, why this rate may exist. And then facilities and physical health. I found during my research there was a uh, correlation uh, between the quality of sports facilities and the long-term health of students after they graduate. And this specific study was uh, focusing from 1970 to 2000 uh, and incorporated around 1,200 students. And uh, the students who attended schools with good sports uh, departments with uh, proper funding uh, typically maintain physical activity throughout life, largely due to developing habits in high school that continued throughout the rest of their life. So students who attended schools with well-funded facilities, well-funded sports centers, typically lived longer, happier lives. Uh, as for advice and my future plans, I am uh, planning on attending George Mason University, uh, and I will be going to major in mechanical engineering. And my advice for future students is you can't really treat this as a means to an end. You need to appreciate the journeys you're going through, appreciate what you're doing, and because this is an opportunity you may not get often. So you truly need to appreciate what you're doing while you're doing it. And yeah, questions? Great moderator. You're a very solid presenter. And your patience is fantastic. Um, as you were working with Mr. Today and the presenters today, is there anything that you came across that just kind of you that you wouldn't have thought would have fallen under, under his umbrella? Um, not, there wasn't too much that was super surprising to me. Um, the, honestly, the thing that I was most surprised by was um, uh, the presentation that was discussing how he contributed funding. I, I was surprised by that, but nothing during my internship was that I didn't expect him to do. I can tell you as someone who has been a business person before this building was open, that that mentally it impacted through the construction and the business and rebuilding with glorious facilities. I stopped hearing kids say things like we're just regional. And all of a sudden there was pride in their academics and their neighborhood and our, our graduation rate went up. Probably not, but it might increase the long-term health of students. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh. 
I did not. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where the future's heading. We could very well be using, very well be using AI and everything. But I did not use it on this presentation. Perfect. And then down is next. What is down, down is next? So just like when you're editing your slideshow, the next slide's always down. Down is next. You want to go back or up? If you push the wrong one, just push yeah, the other way. Yeah, got it. This has to be directly on. So it doesn't really work on the side. So just point it. If you need to point it. Okay? Got it. Um, just stand in between those two things. Where do I point the, the thing at? Is that computer over there? Mm -hmm. the, the oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, the little. Make sure you breathe. Breathe. Uh, yeah. um, if you get stuck, take a pause, take a deep, deep breath, and focus on what you're learning. Nobody knows what you've learned. Yeah. Sometimes when you learn a lot, just tell your story about what you've learned. Yes. Then share that with us, right? Tell us about it. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, and we do interest in facing that. Mm -hmm. We'll see you in the back. Got it. Any yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Landon Schroeder, and I decided to do my senior capstone project specifically on the U.S. military and the impact of physical health and nutrition on students. In this picture, I'll give you all a little bit of context of what it actually is. So it was one December morning. I was sitting in government class where these four men walked in and surprised me with a $180,000 NROTC Marine Corps Options Scholarship. That's not the point of this picture. The point of the picture is the two individuals in the green are why I'm doing this project. They've, throughout my four years of being in the JROTC program, have taught me everything I know about being a leader. That leads me to my research question. How has physical health and nutrition impacted military recruitment? I'm going to go back. On the left, Lieutenant Colonel. He served 23 years as an active duty Marine infantry officer, a Purple Heart recipient who was wounded in battle after saving somebody who was already wounded. That's a hero to me. Standing on my right is Staff Sergeant Strong, served 13 years active duty as an enlisted infantry personnel. He was wounded very badly. He spent two years in the hospital learning how to do everything we take for granted every single day, walking, brushing our teeth, reading a book. Two years. Think about that. Your junior and senior year, this man spent lying in a hospital bed, learning everything again. <laughs> All right. There we go. This led me to founding my own club at this school, which amounted to quite success, um, the non-traditional sports club. Little did I know when I started this how much work it truly is to start and run a club. Um, the first order of business was reaching out to athletic director Coach Fowler and getting it approved. Within the approval, you have to fill out a lot of paperwork and get a list of people who are willing to do it. That's where I started the recruitment process. I texted just about every group chat I was a part of, asking who wants to be in this club. A lot of, yeah, sure, whatever it is. I went with it. I got them to sign. We'll see how it goes. I would say starting a club is similar to starting a business, except for the fact that your finances aren't like attached to it. But uh, you have those doubts, like this might not su succeed. I might have to come up with something else for my senior project. 
And that thought scared me. So I devoted a lot of my time to making sure this would succeed. And this is the flyer that was made and put out in all the hallways for recruiting new members. Um, it wasn't that successful. It, we got about six or seven people that sent emails asking to be a part of it from the flyer. And the next part of starting a club is getting a sponsor. My good friend's father, Luke Farkas, Mr. Coach Farkas, or Wesley Farkas, decided to be the club sponsor for this. I went to him, was like, hey, I got this idea. Um, I want to run with it. He said, sure, I'll support you. Let me know what I need to do. He signed his name on the paper and went with it. All right. And this is where Miss Richards comes in. Um, it was one summer afternoon-ish. It was prior to the start of the school year. I was like, I need a way for everybody to be able to communicate, whatever it may be. So I contacted Miss Richards, uh, responded very quickly, thank you. And I was able to set up a meeting to start this Canvas page. Much easier process than I thought it would be. And yeah. So I set up the Canvas page and the home page, added all the new members, which if any of y'all have ever done that, it is the most tedious thing we ever do. You have to go and find everybody's email and then copy like that email onto the thing and then add something to it. Um, quite lengthy. But next step was to set up an interest meeting. Going into this interest meeting, I had no clue what to expect. I thought maybe like 10, 15 people would show up, like predominantly my close friends who are excited about this. But I did not realize how fast word actually spreads in high school. And uh, the number was actually 71 people who filled out the form for attendance. Uh, interest meeting went very well. First tournament was starting that later that week. And within that, I made a mission statement, um, a yearly outline. It was an overwhelming success. After, I had to make a sign-up sheet that everybody could sign up for the tournaments. Each tournament was played in a March Madness style bracket, where if you win, you move on. If you lose, you're eliminated. I think this kind of made some hype for everyone, but these Google Forms were all made by me, and I created these templates for the tournaments so that everyone could access and see their matchups without me having to type it out every single time. So that was extremely beneficial and also time consuming, but it was great. Um, yeah. So the first tournament, not, didn't all again really know what to expect, but ended up being very good. Um, I applaud all the current members that had no clue how to play pickleball in their courageousness of coming out and trying it. I did have a little lesson right there of how exactly to play the game. And uh, everyone caught on pretty quickly, which made me very pleased. Um, there were 32 teams that signed up. And over the course of the tournament, superintendent came out, assistant superintendent, principal Han, and assistant vice principal, um, Ms. Hudak, all came out to watch. The next tournament, by popular demand, was Ultimate Frisbee. Personally, I did not want to do this, but I was so happy that we did do it because this like really showed me what this club was about. One uh, afternoon, I was setting up for it, and Coach Fowler so happily said, Landon, do you want me to paint some lines for you for the tournament? I said, that, that would be great. And yeah, there were eight teams that participated of 10 people on each team, so about 80 people played. That was the second tournament. This took place from October to like beginning of November. And then the last tournament for the 2023 school year was spike ball. Uh, rain or shine, we play. Uh, we moved to the gym one day when it was pouring rain out, and that was a huge success. Uh, we had 32 teams again sign up, 64 people. And you can see our champions uh, won the non-traditional belt. Luke Mano and Jack Alston, a great, a great tradition we have now. They get to keep the belt for the whole month of November, or December it was. All right. Uh, I'm going to finish talking about non-traditional. Currently, we have 229 members with also eight teachers signed up. Overwhelming, I would say, success. And this is the second part of my project, which is kind of community service, kind of an internship. Um, this is the MCJRTC Raiders Platoon. We train three mornings a week. I'm the commander for this team. Um, doing various physical fitness events. On the left, that was our first ever competition. 
where we went to Mountain View High School to take on 24 other teams, where we ended up placing fifth. Um, yeah. And then on the right, this was one morning where we participated in the Navy Youth Physical Fitness Testing. Um, we go against other schools all around our region, competing for a spot to go to San Diego to compete in the month of June. Uh, our scores were very well. The averages were 71-ish push-ups, 88 sit-ups, 8 foot 7 broad jump, 14 pull-ups, and a 46 second 300 meter shuttle, which is very well, and I think we're competitive for that national spot. But I want to, oh, wrong one. These are my mentors for this. The men I mentioned earlier, they really did not mentor me in how to be a good Raiders commander, but they mentored me for four years on how to be a good leader. I applied these skills that they taught me to lead this team. That was a very great lesson that I learned. And uh, I got some feedback from a few of the Raiders anonymously on uh, their perspective of being a part of it. These responses were overwhelmingly amazing. Um, made me really feel like I made an impact on their lives. Uh, the top one you can see, this individual was not too comfortable when they first came out, but they were extremely proud that they did and just the camaraderie and family that we've built and every morning that we've gone was really great for her. This leads me to my internship. Uh, I interned with Mrs. Rachel Tate in the Goochland Veterans Project helping out with various tasks and assignments she asked us to do um, throughout the school year. Yeah, my internship started at the beginning of the school year in September and is going to end tomorrow <laughs> with the DC field trip. Um, throughout my time, I have pretty much just helped Ms. Tate talk about the project anywhere she's going to mention it. You know, she wants interns to come and explain what it's really about. Um, helping out at interview day and anything she needs done, um, going to spark a conversation. I remember being a junior, and I remember it was hard to talk to veteran. Like, I didn't really know what to say. So just going up to like a group like that and just engaging in a conversation was really helpful to those kids. And as I mentioned earlier, this is my mentor, Mrs. Rachel Tate. I'm sure y'all love hearing about the Veterans Project. Ooh. There we go. All right, so in the military, there's a term called introspective hot wash. This is essentially a reflection of how your project went. From the perspective of the Raiders team, I believe I could have improved in using more of a participa participative leadership approach where I allowed the other um, Raiders to really like plan the workouts, do everything they wanted to do instead of just like planning all these workouts on my own and doing them. You see, yeah. In, uh, in the non-traditional sports club, I think more female involvement was definitely an area of improvement. Um, the last time I checked, we only had about 18% of the members were females and only about less than 10% in each tournament were females. So I think just getting the word out more would have been better. Um, Along with that, I think maybe making the tournaments structured slightly different where if you lose, you're out. Maybe you lose twice and you're out. Or maybe having different um, like level brackets because some students were definitely more expert at these types of sports than others. And all these matchups were completely randomized. So it wasn't fair for some students. I think that's definitely an area I could have improved on. And lastly, with the Veterans Project, I think just being more actively involved just in, in all aspects of the project I could have definitely done better on. Um, any advice I would give to current upcoming seniors is don't listen to your gut. Listen to your heart. Your gut tells you what you should do. Your heart tells you what you want to do. When I first started my project, I thought I was going to do something like financial business related. And then I realized, What's that going to do for me? I'm not going to leave an impact on anybody um, or anything. And I think with my project now, it has left a much better impact on people and everybody in our community, especially since Goochland is such a wonderful place where there's so much opportunity. 
That's my advice to any up and coming seniors. And for my future plans, I'm still waiting to hear back from the United States Naval Academy. Um, but I did receive that scholarship, which uh, if I do not get into the Naval Academy, I will either take to Tulane University or Virginia Tech to study chemical engineering. Questions? Uh, my research really was that like the American health system has not been helpful in getting our recruits. Our recruiting numbers are down substantially. Um, the last time I checked, 23% of citizens in the United States are able to actually serve in the military, which is substantially lower to Vietnam when there was about 80 some percent who were able. And I accredited this to the nutrition in our country. I think the FDA could do a significantly better job of like, not approving certain foods to be put on the shelf. Foods with these industrialized seed oils or these highly processed foods which are quite detrimental to our health in lowering our life expectancy over recent years. Um, I didn't really talk too much about the nutrition aspect in this presentation because some of those takes can be kind of controversial. Um, but that was good. Yes, ma'am. Luke. I would have to go with uh, Will Johns and Lance. Jack. I can. So um, the policy was if you were unable to attend a game, I would do everything in my power to reschedule your game. Um, however, with certain students like Jack, there were multiple conflicts, and I was not going to hold up the tournament um, from their benefit. So I decided to remove him or replace him with somebody else. So I think, like, reflection for my part is I should have had more people help me. Like a lot of this stuff took me like the whole entire night to do. Um, I think next year moving forward, we will hold interviews for specific spots, um, like a president, maybe two vice presidents, secretary slash, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Just so that the workload is more manageable for people. Yeah, but I, th I think that's moving forward. And I think maybe I can put some of these ideas in future like officers, I guess you could say, for it, like what should happen that I was not able to do. Maybe share some of the data. Yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. What do you feel like projects you have I think just like the going into something, just knowing completely nothing. When I went into starting a club, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what it would entail. I think going into Raiders, I was given this role. And I think kind of the philosophy of the military is you go with it, you run with it, you figure it out. And I think just that aspect of really figuring out what I need to do and just researching and reading, like what do I do in this situation, in this situation, really helped me. Duncan? Um, it's really hard to say like who the Raiders MVP was because we all like complement our strengths and weaknesses very well. But um, I don't know, we all just have different like attributes that we're better at. Like some people are definitely better at the cardio side and some people like your brother are definitely better at the strength side. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you, thank you. Oh.
No. Day two. Yes. Please join me in welcoming Parker. All right, let's get this going. So my project is the ins and outs of home building. Oh, it actually did work. So my topic is home building. Why I chose it is I've always been around home building, never like in it like I was for this or how I have been recently. But my dad was a major influence. He's always been in home building. He's always worked for home building companies. He started at a company called Main Street Homes. They do a couple homes around here. They're a pretty big company, and so, but he left Main Street and has moved to RCI, which is the company that I did my internship at. They're over in Mechanicsville. I've always found home building to be interesting. My dad's always talked about it ever since I was a kid. And he, uh, the way that we built my house, my mom was never too happy with it, so she always made changes. And so every time she wanted to do a change, my dad would go, no, don't touch it. I'll get my crew to come and do it. So he'd always get guys to come. Uh, he'd get them at a lower cost because he knew them from work because he has so many connections. Same with like appliances and all sorts of other stuff. He could get them through like main building sources because he's friends with some of the guys who owns things. Like ABC Supply Company, KBM, stuff like that. All right, so my research question was what goes into building a home from start to finish? I knew a little bit about home building coming into this, but not nearly as much as I do now, because there is a ton. It's not exactly just laying a couple bricks, putting some wood up, putting some furniture in and moving in. It starts months and months before that. Before they can even think of putting houses down, they have to go, they're in the, so RCI is in Mechanicsville, Hanover County, so they have to go to Hanover County to even get a permit to even consider building neighborhoods. And then and then they have to do site development, they have to do plumbing and electrical and all that, drainage, irrigation. Because building these big neighborhoods that take up a lot of acres, it has a big like ecological impact on like am animals around and stuff like that. So they have to think about excuse me. They have to think about all that before they start building their neighborhoods. And then after that they can go in and get the permits for individual lots and how they want to shape the neighborhood, what size the houses are, things like that. All right, so for my professional learning experience, like I said, I worked with RCI Builders. Specifically, it was a man named Brian Click. He's one of the project managers there. He's one of many. I worked alongside some of the other ones, but he was the main guy that I worked with. He was working in a neighborhood called Stag's Leap. This is the uh, plans here for the neighborhood. These are all the lot numbers and things that are going on in the lots. So one thing about home building is there is so much going on always. Every time you pull into homes that are being built, there's like three plus crews on every single house, whether that's siding, flooring, electrical, all sorts of stuff, roofing. There's always guys HVAC, there's always guys on these houses. 
And another thing is that you have to get permits for every single thing that you do that comes with that. This is a, a termite service record. This is one of the things before you, you can even move in. They have to spray in and around the houses for things like termites and other bugs to get uh, approved. And then you have to have inspectors come in for everything to, improve, to approve all these records so that they can move on to building the next steps. These are more pictures from my internship. This is what it starts as. Back there is an irrigation lake where it's built so that all the runoff from all the building supplies and stuff doesn't go into the woods or surrounding properties. This is a lot that hasn't been developed yet. It's near the back of Stag's Leap. This is one of the houses that was in framing. So one funny thing about home building is sometimes the crews that you hire don't always do such a good job. So we were in a house one time and he was showing me around the house. And so imagine this is the back wall of a house. And so usually you have a board in the middle of the house that goes from the roof all the way down to the flooring, into the concrete. And it's supposed to be supported by side beams so that nothing happens to it. But sometimes guys feel lazy and they don't want to do the things properly. So he grabs the board that's supposed to hold up the entire wall, shakes it, and the entire side of the house just shakes back and forth because the beam wasn't supported by anything. They just kind of laid it in there. So that was interesting. And then this is... Well, this is a different neighborhood. He manages a couple neighborhoods, but his main neighborhood that he's doing right now is Stag's Leap. This is one of the finished houses, or almost finished. The inside has to get flooring done, but I was going around the property. Another thing they have to do is they do uh, inspections of the outside, so if you have like any debris or trash around the house, you'll fail inspection, and then they have to get a cleanup crew to come clean it up. All right, so for my community service, I am planning to work for Habitat for Humanities, sort of like Cole said, uh, but the opposite side. Uh, instead of designing things, I'm going to help build the houses. I have not done my community service yet. I've gotten in contact with someone who works for Habitat for Humanities, and when they start their home building process, I will go in and help build the houses for the people who cannot afford them. One. All right, why my professional learning experience was significant. So I, one of my choices uh, after college is to become a project manager. It's something that I'm interested in. So this uh, project really helped me to learn more about this. I learned as much as I possibly could in this week about all the little things. So whether that's from the start the, to all the way to the end, even things like this. So there's a system that they've Hanover's put in place. I don't know how recently, but it's been in the last year that I've been working there. It's called a QI system. So the inspector will go in and they will review a house basically on all the little things. So if you have like mud on the siding or if you have like scratch marks on the walls, if your ceiling fan has dust on it, they'll mark you down, it's out of 100. You can see things like these little dots here. Each of these, they would count, they'd write it down, and you'd get tick marks off for that. And so all your houses get scored out of 100, uh, and that goes on the website, so customers and stuff can see how good your scores are. They, it's for all the home building companies, so people can see how well the home companies are doing and how, how good quality the houses are how good they take care of them as in the building process. Because things get dirty when materials are just being thrown around in the building process. And uh, cleaning them up is a really big part of them to make the houses look nice. Because some of these houses are sold even before they're being built. There's a, a design lab in the main office of RCI that has all the colors, the floor plans, the houses, everything. They come in and they can design the houses before they're even built. And so once they do that, the RCI does this thing where they can do walkthroughs anytime they please. So in any step of the home building process, a customer can just walk through the house, which is usually on weekends when there's less crews working. So if your house is just covered in junk and debris and trash and a customer walks through their house hoping to see their house under construction and there's just junk everywhere, they're not going to be too happy about it.
So that's a, a big thing about keeping their, the houses clean. These are more pictures from the from houses that I was in that are under construction. These are in a neighborhood called Oak Grove. And that, this goes again with the cleaning process. You can see the broom. I got to be a maid for a day and, and sweep houses. Because before they can come in and do any of the flooring, you have to get rid of all the debris and the dust before that. So my research was on, I did, I looked up uh, the cost of houses in Virginia and things like that. So it's 100, on average in Virginia to build a house from nothing. It's $155 per square foot. And if you take that for a 200 or not 2,500 square foot house, do a little math, it's like 390 almost grand. So that's a, that's a lot of money. So, and that's a lot of money that a client's going to pay for their house to want, they want to look exactly how they envision it. This is a, a model in Stag's Leap that you can see that a, so a client can go in there and see what their house might look like so they can get a good idea. This is one of the houses. It's a little above the average, half a million dollars. It's expensive. So the client side of the job is extremely important because if you're not doing a good job or the client doesn't like the house or what's going on with it, then that can be really bad for the builders because the uh, clients are paying a lot of money for these houses and the margins are not that big per, per house. So they need, uh, they need these houses built well and they need customer satisfaction because even after the, the houses are built, if things break or if things happen, RCI will come in and fix them uh, after the, it's like a, I think it's a couple months after they're built. So they're still responsible for some things in the house even after they're built. So this is one of the examples. This is an extreme example, but this was as a house was being built. This is a text from the customer about the houses. Some people get extremely particular about their houses. This is, you can see, this is Brian Click, my mentor. This is all, these are things for different rooms. And these are all little things about their houses. They did a walkthrough on the weekend. And some of these aren't even bad, but like you can see in the kitchen, scratches above outlets from installation. There was a, they found a remote, but the remote didn't work. The fan wobbled. There's debris in the lights uh, fixture in the dining room. Same with the back porch. They had all of these to say. And uh, sometimes they have cleaning crews, but a lot of the times it's the project manager himself who has to fix all of these. Usually the clients aren't this picky about their stuff because some of this is just like dirt and dust on things. But it's still a lot of things that you have to fix. A lot of things can go wrong. So being a project manager is an extreme amount of work because this is, this is for one house. And the guy I worked with, Click, I think he had up to 40 houses at once. So you think about 40 customers and then different crews for each house that's a lot of people to manage for one house. I mean, I don't think every time I was with him, every 10 minutes or so, he'd be getting a call. He was constantly on the phone talking to people, whether they were subcontractors, customers, stuff like that, bosses. There's a lot of that goes into these houses just behind the building that a lot of people don't see. All right, so reflection. I thoroughly enjoyed this mentorship. I have a, an interest in this topic, so I enjoyed getting to learn more about uh, being a project manager and all that goes into it. Um, if I could do anything different, I'd probably take more pictures. I just had pictures of stuff going on, not really me there, because a lot of the time there were crews, and sometimes there would be client walkthroughs, so it'd be kind of weird if I just posted up, take pictures with clients, because some of them don't really like that. but. Overall, it was, a, it was a great experience for me. And advice for uh, future Blue Ridge students, do something you enjoy. Because if you, if you don't, if you want to just try something easy, you're probably going to be miserable doing this project. Because it's a, it's a lot of work that goes into a lot of thought process, and it makes it much easier if you really enjoy what you're talking about and what you're doing. So my plans for the future. I think I'm going to go to Randolph-Macon next year. And 
And a good thing about RCI is they have a lot of houses around uh, Ashland area. They have a couple neighborhoods. They're, one they're recently developing is called Luck Farms. It's just out past Ashland. So I'll be able to continue some work around uh, Ashland while I'm in college, which will be nice. So I think I will enjoy that. And any questions? hundred percent to have quality it's going to take an extremely large amount of time just to do even a room uh, after you're they're done everything before furniture goes in and clients have to move in it could take hours just to make sure there's no scratches there's no paint marks there's no scuffs anywhere to make sure the house is perfect they have a system where they'll do tapes they'll do blue tape for scuffs and then there's green tape for sheetrock mess up so they'll go in, and I've seen like a thousand pieces of tape in one house. And that they, people have to go in, paint crews and sheet rockers have to go in and fix all that before they can do anything else. So it takes an extremely large amount of time. And then with more people coming in, that's more money they have to pour into the house. That's why the margins are so small for every single house they build. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a lot of face-to-face -face with customers. I did a couple walkthroughs where they would show the house like uh, after they had most of the stuff in, minus like the furniture and the appliances and stuff. And so I had that, but most of the customers would just deal, deal directly through the, uh, the project managers because every client has the project manager that's building their house's number so they can ask them questions or they can call them, see how the house is doing. So I was mostly on the side but I did get to see and listen to some of, some of the clients' praises and complaints. What's the, what county in our state has the greatest, well, I guess you might say, hottest real estate market? Counting to me, that you can notice it. I did not get what county has the highest, but I know Loudoun County is has the most money into it and as i would say if i had to guess the houses would be the most expensive up there ashland right now is developing extremely fast there's tons of neighborhoods all around it that are going up there's like three or four around ashland itself two of which are rcis so that i mean even in the last year uh one of rci's neighborhood luck farms has doubled in size and all the houses already sold Yeah, it would probably go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. The bell is about to go off in yes. like a minute, and there's Absolutely. like an announcement. Okay. Um, 
near you in the room. <laughs> if we get out of the same forward this So this down forward down yeah, up is back. Take you to the next one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm hitting my fingers. That's okay. Hi, my name is Taylor Chapani, and I did my project on the impact of music education on youth. So first off, why music education? Um, I've been involved in music activities my whole life. I started at the young age of four when my mom forced me to join my church's children's choir. And I quickly learned that I am not very vocally talented, but more instrumentally inclined. And so through the years, I was able to participate in many activities, including ORF, which is like a percussion ensemble, a violin ensemble. And more recently, I've been able to do orchestra and band. And um, this is marching band. This is kind of my life. This is what I do. Um, I was drum major this past year, and these are some of my best friends I've met through the program. And um, this is really what inspired me to do this project not just the music aspect but the community that i've built and i want to make a difference and like impact them and help them in the future years even after i'm gone so for i found my research question pretty quickly i knew from freshman year that i wanted to do something about music and so my main focus was how music appreciation can affect the growth and education value for students and um, I found through my research that there are, oh, <laughs> there are three main impacts that music education can give on people. One is an actual education aspect as it helps your brain develop faster. And studies have shown that students who participate in music education classes, whether that be chorus or band or orchestra, are actually 24% more likely to graduate. And another interesting statistic I found is that um, music majors in college. Good afternoon, Bulldogs. Travel time for Bulldog Block has ended. Students should currently be in their Bulldog Block locations for the day. All 12th grade students with early release should have exited the building. Only students with a path to the restroom are permitted in the hallway. Thank you for your cooperation and enjoy the remainder of your day. So music education or music performance majors in college are, um, when they apply to med school, if they do, actually have a 66% acceptance rate, which is higher than any other undergraduate major, which was really surprising to me because you don't hear of a lot of music students applying to med school. It also impacts your brain development. It increases your um, executive function and it increases your sensory skills as well as it increases your overall wellness both physically and mentally it music helps reduce anxiety and increase like creativity flow 
as well as physically, you don't think about it a lot while you're playing, but if you're playing an instrument, you're using a lot of like lung support when you're blowing into the instrument or singing, and it actually increases um, your lung capacity and lowers your blood pressure, as well as community. Um, a lot of people find it difficult to connect with people and other communities around the world, whether that be because of different cultures or language barriers. But the good thing about music is it's pretty universal. Everyone knows about it. Everyone has chances to play or listen to music. And it's just a way that we can all connect through something, even if we can't physically understand each other. So unfortunately, there are some current issues with music education in the schools. One is the appreciation level has dropped significantly since music education was first introduced. And due to the lack of appreciation, it also decreases the funding because less people are coming to fine arts events or less people are interested in donating money towards these programs. And for those of you who don't know, music is a lot more expensive than you'd think. Instruments themselves are thousands of dollars. Personally, I play flute and piccolo, and between those two instruments, I think I spent $5,000 just purchasing them, and that doesn't include yearly repairs, yearly cleanings, and also you have to purchase music rights because you know you can't just like steal someone's music. That's not fun. And as well, you have to, for marching man specifically, you have to purchase show props, and you have to pay for travel, and all the competitions normally have an entrance fee. So that is a big issue in schools as there's just a lack of funding in the music programs. Um, especially one that I've noticed in my research that hit close to home is rural communities and the lack of access they have to music education. Because specifically in Goochland, I know at least, I have had the opportunity to go out to Richmond and other areas where they're out to participate in like the Richmond Youth Orchestra and wind ensembles. But a lot of students here either don't have transportation or they don't have the money to get to those locations. And we offer very limited music courses here. We have one band class, chorus, show choir, and we're expanding, but it's still very limited in our options. So for my internship, I knew I wanted to do something with the band program here because that has been the biggest part of my life the past couple of years. I think I've spent almost as much time in the band room as I have at my own house the past four years. And so I originally wasn't sure what I was gonna do, but at the end of the last year, I talked to my band director, Mr. Jay Sykes. He is the director at Guchul Middle School and Guchul High School. I don't know how he does it, he teaches seven classes. And um, he told me that I should become a student aide for one of his seventh grade classes. So I signed up for that, and we didn't know at the time, but that seventh grade class turned into um, an actual seventh grade class, about five eighth graders who could not fit into the eighth grade class, and two high schoolers who could not fit into our high school class. So it's a bit of a combination of a class. It's not your average band class, but I spend a lot of time working with the seventh graders. I was able to conduct them in class. I've actually there have been a couple classes where Mr. Sykes has been out of town where I've been able to like go through lesson plans with them and actually conduct them the whole time. I've been able to work with the eighth graders because there's only five of them, so it's difficult for them to actually learn their music while they don't have the rest of the instruments there. So we will go off into one of the practice rooms, go over their music, I'll help them if they need help to the best of my ability. And I've also been able to tutor one of the seventh grade flute players because he transferred from his old school and they didn't give him the best quality education. So he wasn't exactly sure how to play at the start of the year. He's still struggling, but we've managed to get down a couple scales and he's working his way towards hopefully being able to play at the spring concert, as well as I've been able to help the two high school students in there as they, they're really just on their own because they don't have a band to play with, but they have been able to play at our concert still, which is great. And I was able to conduct the seventh graders and one of the songs at the winter concert, that's right there. Um, the song was called Christmas in the Kitchen. It was really funny. We had a couple kids playing like on pots and pans and the audience loved it. And I've just been really grateful for this opportunity because I, I was hesitant to do it at first because I knew Mr. Sykes very well already and I was like, I kind of wanna branch out and explore something with 
like people that don't know me as well, but he's been a very great mentor. He's given me lots of opportunities. And so that leads into the third part, which was my community service. And my original plan with this was to work in the back of the band room where we have all the music that Goochland has ever collected in its life, all in file cabinets and it's all out of order and no one knows where anything is. So my plan was to go through and organize that. Leah and I started that at the end of last year. We didn't get very far, but we tried. Um, but that didn't end up working out. And then I remembered last year, um, I had a conversation, some backstory for this first. Um, I'm in ROTC, I've been involved in the program for four years. And I have, I've loved being a part of it. It's taught me so many leadership skills. And I, we have a military ball every year. It's called the um, Marine Corps Birthday Ball. And we were watching a video of it because we always have a ceremony with like a sword detail and a cake detail. And it's very professional. But when we were watching videos of the, the actual Marine Corps doing it, I noticed that they had a band. And I was like, hey, why don't we have a band? And Lieutenant Colonel told me, if you want to start one, go for it. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I decided to make that my community service. And I got a group together, um, the kid beside me, and then those two in the back. And we created a drum and bugle corps, and we performed at the birthday ball. And it was difficult at first because I didn't have the right music. And then we also needed two um, percussionists and only we only had one so I did learn bass drum but we ended up pulling it together we spent many hours practicing and showing up early to school to get it together but it was a really great success we had the chance to play there and I just got asked last week if we could perform again at the IG inspection in May so when the we have people from the Marine Corps coming in to inspect our entire company will be there playing as they walk in to welcome them. And so I was very grateful for that opportunity. We had lots of positive feedback and I hope they'll be able to continue it next year. I think they will be able to. And so the significance, the kid in that picture on the far left, uh, that's one of my best friends, Garrett Palmer, and he will be continuing the community service project next year. He hopes to increase the band size and have hopefully a full band, which is gonna be difficult, but I, I think he can do it. Um, and we have a spring concert coming up for the concert band, so I'm hoping to conduct the seventh graders again in that. And it just really, this project has impacted me because it made me realize I'm a lot more capable than I thought I was. I was worried about starting up a whole community service project myself and trying to conduct the seventh graders when I didn't have much experience conducting outside a marching band. But it really encouraged me to step outside my comfort zone and get in contact with new people. I learned that seventh graders aren't as scary as they seem. <laughs> They're just a little loud sometimes, but we can work around that. And my advice for future seniors would be to Find a project that you enjoy, but also not to procrastinate in it, because I like to procrastinate. And I was up pretty late making these slides. <laughs> but overall, it was great. I had an amazing time. And if I had done anything differently, I would have taken more photos, because I was so actively involved in either teaching the kids or working with the ROTC cadets that I forgot to take a lot of pictures. And that is my one regret. One regret one regret with this project. And so next year, I plan to attend Liberty University and I will be majoring in music education. And I'll, I have recently been accepted into their marching band, so I'll be doing that. And hopefully if my plans go well, I'll also be able to double major in flute performance. And my plan is to become an athletic band director at a college. Um, I love Mr. Sykes, but he's very busy and that's not his fault. He is teaching seven classes. So he just didn't have time to like send me the spreadsheet and like get all that worked out. But I'm still willing to do it if he can get me the spreadsheet. I've been trying to do that for a couple years, but 
it's just a matter of like time and I don't want to overwhelm him when he has seven classes. Well, and I, I love what you did with the teachers back home. Sometimes the internship and community service can kind of meld into one and point in a different direction than what you're doing. It's really helpful to see. Thank you. That was me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luke Farkas, and I did my senior capstone project on sports for children with disabilities. Um, my research question for this project was, how does participation in team sports affect children with disabilities? Um, the why for this project, um, I've been involved with uh, different organizations for people with uh, special needs for a large part of my life. Um, Night to Shine is an organization for, um, it's a prom put on for uh, adults and kids with um, special needs. And I volunteered with that for, I think, like six years, something like, something like that, a long time uh, in various different roles. And then this year, I took Unified PE, which is a PE class where um, our special needs students at Goochland get to be paired with students without disabilities, and they get to uh, do activities together. Um, so for my internship, uh, I was fortunate to uh, be able to work with Sportable, which is a nonprofit organization that creates opportunities for people with physical disabilities and uh, visual impairments. Um, for my internship, my mentor was Tyler Rowe. He is the uh, program coordinator for Sportable. Um, and throughout my internship, I was able to work with their uh, youth wheelchair basketball program. Um, uh, the majority of my internship was at Beulah Rec Center, which is in uh, Chesterfield, Virginia. Um, when I got there, I would help Tyler unload his, his van, and that held all the wheelchairs. Uh, kind of a side note, um, a lot of the kids don't have their own uh, sports wheelchairs, uh, which are special for um, indoor sports um, because they are expensive and um, they're just hard because like, the kids are con continually growing, so it's hard for a family to invest in that. So Tyler is able to provide them with wheelchairs. Um, during the practices, what was really cool is I actually was able to, while I was helping coach their uh, youth team, I was actually in a wheelchair myself. So I was able to experience um, what they're going through on their level. And throughout drills, I was able to learn with them and to encourage them and really see what they're going through. 
Um, so that was really cool to see. Um, afterwards, I helped him clean up and put all the wheelchairs uh, back in his yeah, back in his van, and then I was pretty much good to go. Um, I did this on uh, Tuesday evenings for about two months. Um, additionally, um, on top of that, um, not really uh, my internship, but more of just the community service. Um, I helped run the scorebooks at a couple of adult wheelchair basketball games. Um, it was really interesting. It was really cool to see uh, wheelchair basketball at a high level, um, and I was able to help with that. Um, uh, side note, oh, as again, um, Richmond and Sportables is holding this year's National Wheelchair Basketball Championship. Um, it's in April, and that's really cool. I might be helping volunteer with that as well. Um, for my community service, um, I was involved with Special Olympics, um, specifically Special Olympics in Goochland. Uh, this is my mentor right here, uh, Steve Rosen. Uh, he's the head coach uh, for the Goochland team, um, and I helped with uh, their bocce ball and basketball teams, and this spring I'll be helping with their track team. Um, Really, I just helped them at their practices. Um, for bocce ball, um, I would get there. I would help them at practice. I would help them stretch. Um, I would help them to learn how to play the game, uh, stay behind the flags, uh, learn how to take turns. And uh, really, this the biggest thing that I did was um, just be there as an encouragement. Uh, something that was really cool was um, at their area games, uh, uh, Mr. Rosen uh, was unable to attend, so I was their head coach for the area games. Uh, so I was in charge of making sure they got checked in correctly and uh, helping them to get to their games on time, on top of just encouraging them and uh, being a positive influence on them. Uh, for basketball, um, I play basketball, so I was unable to go to a lot of their practices because their practices were uh, during the same time as mine, but uh, I was presented with the opportunity to help referee at their tournaments. So it was an awesome opportunity for me to continue volunteering while also getting to come watch them play. Um, uh, so circling back to my research question, uh, so how does participation in team sports affect children with disabilities. Um, this is just a really cool um, thing to think about for me. Um, sports is really helpful for them to be physically active because um, children with disabilities are more susceptible to uh, health issues due to inactivity. And um, also, it really helps in a child's development to improve their fine motor skills by playing sports, um, which they which if it's not developed at a young age can affect them for the rest of their life. Uh, some benefits specific to team sports is the helping with communication and helping with uh, teamwork and learning how to listen to people who are trying to help them uh, to achieve a common goal. Um, uh, the last thing that I would say about um, my research is that um, it's really awesome for uh, families uh, to see their children with disabilities succeed and be a part of something. And it gives them an opportunity to encourage their children to work at something. Um, all, this, uh, all this research being said, um, my experiences really just like proved everything that I researched right. Um, I got to see all the things that I researched just in action and day-to-day -day life, and that really reinforced the meaning of all the, because like a number doesn't tell a whole story in, unless you like see it in action. So that was really cool for me to be able to be a part of that. Um, the significance of this project, um, this project really um, combined two things I'm really passionate about, which is uh, sports and helping encourage and support people 
uh, who need help. Um, uh, it was just a really uh, eye-opening experience for me. It was really uh, beneficial for me to experience something like that. Um, and I'm just really grateful for the opportunities that I was given. Um, uh, my advice for future seniors is pretty much just start thinking about your project um, earlier. Um, definitely, like, you don't have to have your internship or community service set in stone over the summer. But I think it would have really benefited me to uh, think about or at least reach out or have an, a general understanding of what I was maybe going to do so that um, I wouldn't be as stressed out um, during the school year because I got really busy at the beginning of the school year and I put a lot of unnecessary stress on myself for trying to find an internship in community service, uh, which could have been avoided by just uh, thinking through a little bit more. Uh, my future plans, I plan to attend a four-year university, um, probably in Virginia, and I'm trying to study something along the lines of uh, sports management or sports administration. Uh, thank you guys for your time. And Um, I think just uh, reaching out and uh, finding an internship in community service um, and also being able to manage my time uh, doing this during the school year um, on top of the other things that I was involved in. Yeah, for sure. Um, for now, um, like I said, I'm volunteering with their track team this spring, which is kind of, uh, he actually just approached me like this past week about it. And I was like, sure, because I already have a relationship with a lot of those uh, kids. Um, and then, like I said, I might uh, volunteer at the National Wheelchair Tournament, which is in April. <laughs>